I hope I'm in a hot tub when Jesus comes back. <laughs> Hey everybody, your buddy Basil here, and you are listening to the Joy Spiracy Theory. Thanks for tuning in. We've got an excellent conversation for you. A little bit long on this one. Thought about splitting it up, but it was just so good. And uh, look, you guys are just here for the great conversation. You don't care how my back-end logistics work. So here you go. You get the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but, uh, you know, just, just more to love, baby. Okay, before we get going, we got a couple more uh, Patreon supporters I want to give a shout out to, both of which didn't have, they don't have pets, which is okay. We still love them. They're still welcome here. But I'm going to I'm gonna give a shout out to the Schrodinger's cats of uh, Cody and Sonia. Thank you so much, you two. And thank you for your uh, theoretical, hypothetical cats that may or may not exist. Uh, but we won't know until we open that box. But we'll wait until later. So we're praying for you guys. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got enough cats here on this show for you. So so don't even worry. That That's why you come here. It's like a good... Uh, okay, anyways, I'm going off track now. Um, this week we've got a great conversation with Christopher. He's a great guy. He is, he is one of these uh, educated folk we hear about once in a while. Um... PhD in uh, Bible studies, biblical studies, I guess, is like the, the technical term. He's a he's a very smart gentleman, and I love talking to smart people. And uh, we get into, um, you know, the, the, the way we read our Bibles, the context in which the Bible is read. But we also get a chance to look at just the, uh, the another fascinating life of someone just like us listening to this show. Um, oop, got a cat jumping on me. Holy smokes. Uh, but you guys are going to love it. There's there's action, there's adventure, there's excitement, there's a, there's a, the ups and downs of life. And uh, so just get just just get ready for it. And also, if you haven't done so yet, email me at basil.rosewater at gmail.com or leave me a voice message at thejoyspiracytheory.com. And uh, two things. Tell me if you want to come on the show. We need more guests. Hit me up. And also... Uh, another episode of Ask Baz is in the works. That's right, the bonus show over on Patreon. Many people enjoying that. Three episodes up already. So if you want to get in on that, go to patreon.com slash the joyspiracy theory. And if you have questions you want me to answer, send them there. Okay? All right, that's enough for now. We're going to jump into the episode. I'll see you guys on the other side. Hello. Hey, buddy. How's it going? <laughs> Not too bad. Good. I'm glad that we connected. I'm glad that you sent me a voicemail. I'm glad that we have defeated any sort of uh, technical issues, which always invariably come up. This has been pretty easy so far. Well, good. <laughs> I yeah. hope it stays that way. Yeah. Well, before we get too far, why don't you tell me what you're grateful for today? Today, I knew you were going to ask me that. I know. Um, today, actually, you know, I'm really grateful for, I think, you and uh, what you're doing. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I um, have personally been really blessed and just encouraged by uh, the work that you guys are doing, you know, over at um, Canary Cry and then here. And um, I think it's really awesome that you share your platform with just regular old people. Um, I, uh, I kind of see it like, um, coming up in churches and stuff, you know, and, and watching pastors, you know, people get very, um, kind of selfish with the pulpit, I guess you could say, you know, yeah. and it's like this realm of influence, you know, for, for people to share their voice and to share what the Lord's doing in their life. And I've been under, pastors who never get out of the pulpit except maybe two weeks a year when they're on vacation. And then I've sat under pastors who invite other people to come in. Um, and I just think it's really cool that it's not, um, you know, something that people kind of hoard for themselves, but that you're seeing it as, you know, a ministry, something the Lord's given you, and then you're allowing that to be used by others. So I just think that's really cool. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, 
the, the ever since I started, uh, you know, not making it the Basil show, uh, it, uh, it, a is a huge blessing to me because I get to talk and learn about people, but also, uh, I don't know, it's just broadened my horizons and, and, uh, taking a lot of pressure off. I'll say that. Not all the pressure, but just a little bit of pressure. <laughs> just enough to take the edge off. Um, That's good. Yeah. So very good answer. Always good to be thankful for the host of the show that you're on. <laughs> um, what are you thankful for? Oh, you got me. Good one. Only a few people have, have gotten me back. Um, you know, I well, uh, to be very honest, I'm grateful to be talking to you right now. Now, I do, you know, I don't want that to sound like uh, that was a, an easy answer. I could have easily said I'm grateful for lamp or cat. <laughs> but um <laughs> but I'm actually super grateful to have you on the show because let me tell you this, um A, you used my voicemail service, which I love it when people do that. I did. Um, you did. And also that I'm glad to have uh, another uh, a dude on the show. Uh, you know, I try to be as diverse as the Lord has made this beautiful green earth. Um, but I, there hasn't been a guy on the show in a while, I don't think. Although, oh, well. although every time I say that, I'm always reminded that I don't know my lineup of episodes as well as other people. So I'm sure there was a guy on more recent than I remember. But also, I'm so happy to be talking to you because of where you're at. You mentioned um, in your voicemail that you are, what was it, in your a master's program for divinity? Or what was that exactly? Um, yeah, it's actually... Um, I'm working on my PhD ooh. in biblical interpretation. I know. Ooh, oh, see, it's, no, uh, it's, it's good. I'm glad that I, you know, I, sometimes I'm a little afraid. I'll throw out like, oh, you're working on your master's. And they're like, oh, actually, it's just a bachelor's or something. But uh, it's nice that I still undershot it a little bit. Yeah. So you get yeah. to, you still get to impress us all. It's well, you know, that's one of the things it's, uh, it's this, it's, it's terrible telling people every time. Like I hate when I hate when I have to tell people. It really is because there's this weird like, ooh, I bet you, I bet you think you're so smart oh. or something. It's like, no, I don't. Well, I don't. don't worry. You know what? I mean this in the most loving way possible. I've talked to smarter people than both of us, so <laughs> take, don't just good. Don't feel like there's too much pressure. It's all good. <laughs> You don't have to. I mean, Mike Heiser was on the show. Come on, it's hard to. Yeah, talk. I enjoyed that one. That was really good. Actually. Oh, so I good. love him. So good. He's kind of funny because uh, he's the most gracious, wonderful man. But I kind of have to trick him to come on this show. Um, so I'm going to get him on again. <laughs> but okay, I just ch I just checked the check the rest check the records. Uh, last guy on the show was five episodes ago. So Who was that? back in January is when oh, – that's sad to say on a show that I need to put out more. But yes. You should do more shows. I man. should do more shows. <laughs> the people want more shows. I just cringed when I said that out loud. Uh, yes. That Who was, was it? That was Jeremy. Oh, too, I don't think I heard that one. Too Many Monkeys. The last monkeys. one I listened to was Sean. Oh, yeah. Was Sean? Sean was great. Um, that was crazy. He was back in November of 2017. Yep. Sean's great. And I actually just recently talked to Sean, and we might get him back on the show for a little update on some stuff. So we, be, we can look forward great. to here. But that's enough about Sean and Jeremy. Tonight's <laughs> about you, my man. Um, oh, boy. So here's the thing. I'm super eager because I have some things to reveal about myself that we might have in common. Um, but first, I, you know, I, I want to do your story justice, and I'll let you take it from there, which is where are you and where did you come from? Oh, boy. Well, um, I mean, initially I was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, 
I guess, 35 years ago or so, being as that's how old I am. Somewhere around there. <laughs> Somewhere around there. And uh, actually born to um, a Viking grandfather. I understand we have that in common. Oh, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. I am a, I am a of Norwegian descent also. Oh, so. it sounds, I knew I, this felt good. Talking to a real... <laughs> A real brother in so many different senses. So yeah, uh, my, Norwegian from my mom's side, English from my dad's side. I got all of the English blood, though. My younger uh, brother got all of the Viking blood. He's like six two, oh, blonde yeah. hair, just like a just like a Viking, and I'm just like a little <laughs> short, stout English man. But that's okay. It's still in my it's still in my blood. Somewhere. Yeah, it's the blood that matters, man. Yeah. I'll send it into that ancestry thing one time and they can I can get the full scoop. Yeah. And they'll have the full scoop. I've thought about that, but at the same time, you know, we tell our especially as Americans, and I don't want to re- d- derail this too much, but as Americans, you know, we tell our own story of who we are is very tied to our genealogy. And yeah. I feel like 23 and me and ancestry.com and a lot of those things in addition to all the other issues that come with that program, uh, which we talk a lot about on Canary Cry News Talk, check it out, subscribe on iTunes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it has the potential for better or for worse to kind of destroy the your, the story of yourself, you know, because yeah. you spend your whole life telling yourself, you know, or being told that you are, you know, Norwegian and English and then yeah. suddenly it's like, actually, there's a little bit more Dutch in there than you thought. And you're like, no, I don't want to be Dutch. <laughs> yeah. And who was it? Was it uh, Matt Damon or Ben Affleck or one of them had the uh, had the slave traders and their ancestry or something? Oh, and they just s- were like completely shamed by it. Yeah, I think it was Ben Affleck. What a what a silly part of our society that we still shame people for their ancestry. Yeah, I didn't quite understand that. I was like, man, that wasn't you, man. That's okay. Right, which, I mean, uh, there's a, anyways, that's a whole other conversation. But, okay, so we, we're we're brothers in many senses. Continue. Uh, yeah, so um, ended up in Florida at some point. Um, we're, all, Tampa. we're all good Norwegians end up. Yeah, yeah, lots of water. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Ended up in Florida and then um, basically spent most of my life there um, uh, through a, I don't know, a long series of events. I was kind of really just uh, grew up in a Christian home and all that and really was uh, praying and, and spending a lot of time in my late teens, early 20s, kind of um, asking the Lord what he would have me to do with my life, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always had kind of felt a call to some kind of ministry, but never really wanted to do it because it just didn't sound, honestly, one of my first concerns was like, I was like, do pastors make any money? Um, (laughs) Which is funny these days because there's tons of them who are getting filthy rich. But um, there are some, yes, there are some who figured out the the trick. But um, so I was kind of, you know, didn't really want to do that. And through, I had a couple of different conversations. I ended, I wanted to do something meaningful with my life, whatever, whatever. Um, and I ended up becoming a firefighter. So I was oh. a firefighter and a paramedic for a couple of years. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Interesting. Yeah. I could fill the whole time here just telling you stories about that. Yeah, but, um, I bet. It was, it was really fun. It was really cool. I really loved the job. I was really good at the job, but, um, the Lord just kind of stayed on my heart and it was like, uh, I just knew I was supposed to be doing something else. I knew I was supposed to be pursuing ministry. So, um, it kind of happened that we had this missionary at our church at the time. Um, we sent a missionary over to Tunisia. She got married and then she came back with her new Tunisian husband, who was Mm -hmm. just one of the most incredible people um, in the world that I've, that I've ever known. And he was talking to me and he was like, well, how's it going? You're such, you're so great, whatever. And he's like, why are you, why are you a firefighter? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I, I like it. It's, it's rewarding. I get to help people. I save people's lives. It's mm-hmm. what's, what's a better job. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's like, you should be in, you should be in ministry. And then he goes, uh, I'm praying that you get fired from your job. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and I was like, wow, 
wow, thank you. Yeah, um, that's a hardcore dude. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so he ends up taking me one day. We go out for lunch and we have a local um, Bible college right there in our uh, Trinity College of Florida. Um, it's right there in town. And uh, he drives me over there one day. We were out for lunch and he drives me over and walks me into the office and he says he's here to sign up for classes. And I was like, what are you doing, man? Like, seriously, what are you doing? I was like, I'm not signing up for classes. I don't have any money to pay for classes. I don't know what. And they, whatever. He was like, he's going to sign up for classes. So I end up filling out the thing. I sign up and I'm like, I don't know how to pay for this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, some lady from the church um, ends up taking a vested interest in my life. She says she's going to cover the cost of my classes. So wow. she ends up, yeah, she ends up footing the bill for me to go to school to get my, finish my undergrad. Um. And then I was still working at the fire department. So I'm working at the fire department, working on my bachelor's in Christian ministry. And then uh, he comes and visits, you know, and he's like, you, why are you still there? And I was like, well, because I still need money. I still need a job, you know. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm still praying for you, whatever, that you get fired. So <laughs> ends up that I go into work one day. Um, what the a captain comes up to me, walks up to me. He's like, "Hey, we need your keys and your radio, and uh, you need to come get in the truck." And I was like, "What is going on?" Whoa. And they walk me down into the chief's office. Yeah, <laughs> they walk hardcore. me into the chief's office, and I sit down in the chief's office, and I'm like, "What's going on?" And uh, the chief says, "He goes, uh, we're gonna have to let you go." <laughs> huh. And I was like, "What? Why?" Why? What is going on? And then uh, they keep a they keep a log book, you know, of all your shifts. And if there's any, you know, incidents or if anything comes up, you get any bad reports, any of this kind of thing. Um, so he's got my log book right there. Right. He opens it up and he starts looking through it and he's looking through it. And then this like look of confusion comes over his face because there's nothing bad in there. If there was something bad in there, I would have known I'd had to sign a paper. Yeah. There would have been all kinds of different stuff that goes on. And he just kind of looks across the desk over at the captain who brought me in and then he looks over at me and he's like it's just not working out Whoa. <laughs> and i was like wow actually before i had um got a job there a friend of mine knew some people who worked there and he said that um he was like they don't take too kindly to christians in that department up there he said you need to be careful and i was like really that's weird and there were a couple times i kind of tried you know sharing the gospel with some people and kind of tried um you know, talking to some people about Jesus and stuff like that. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it. I still don't know what happened. I, I might've just been terrible. And the whole time I thought I was doing a good job. I don't really know, but I ended up <laughs> right. getting fired. Um, right around the same time, the youth pastor of our church. Wait, uh, you basically got fired. I mean, ba this wasn't on the books, but you basically got fired because they don't take kindly to Christians and I can't say that conclusively. Yeah. I was warned about that before I got there. A okay. friend of mine who knew some people who had worked up there. Uh -huh. I got hired on with another Christian guy. And the shift I was on was notoriously just a bunch of – it was – it a little, was A little awful. rough around they, the edges. They were – I mean it was – you sit down for dinner every night and it's like – uh, they're just talking terrible about all the other guys on all the other shifts everybody's they're all foul mouthed they're watching porn on the computers in the in the station and stuff oh. and i'm just like what is going on in this place so <laughs> i was i kind of ostracized myself a little bit because i couldn't engage in any of the conversations i wasn't doing any of the things they were doing you know so it was kind of like yeah it might not have been this guy's a christian but there was definitely a sense of he's not fitting in you know here with us that kind right. of thing so okay um, so, you know, for whatever reason, however it happened, I got let go, um, from there. And right around the same time, the youth pastor at the church I was at, uh, took a different position at another church somewhere. So there's this vacancy as, at the youth pastor position. So I end up going on and filling that position. So now I'm the youth pastor. I'm going to Bible college. Um, all this stuff is going on. It's, it's pretty cool kind of starting to see some growth in the youth ministry there. I started out with, I had seven kids, I think the first night I was there. And then, you know, at the most we were up to like a hundred kids and kids are getting saved and kids are, you know, committing to go into missions and yeah. do ministry. And it's just like the Lord was, you know, at work in that. And I was like, this is, 
this is really cool. Like I can kind of see what's, what's going on. I can kind of see the plan here. Um, then our pastor falls down extremely ill at the church. Um, he had been dealing with some health problems and it turns out that he just couldn't even fill the pulpit anymore. So he was extremely ill and I was, I guess, the next best qualified there. So then I start preaching every Sunday, um, week in, week out in the regular services. And then I really kind of developed a love for preaching and for teaching. And um, the same lady who had funded my undergraduate, um, by the time I finished, um, we ended up getting a new preacher in. So the, the pastor of the church um, kind of went away. I filled the pulpit for a year. We got a new pastor in. Then he started a course preaching. I went back to kind of full-time youth ministry. But he left one, whatever, sometime around Christmas, you know, one of the two weeks that pastors are gone. And he, you know, I, I preached for him while he was gone. Apparently was, I don't know, some kind of wonderful sermon. The Lord showed up. Praise the Lord. Um, it was it was a great Sunday. So the lady who had been paying for my undergraduate catches me at the door, and she says, hey, we need to talk. Mm. Let's go out for dinner. I was like, okay. Um, so we went out for dinner, and then she said something about well, how whatever. She said, but basically what she said was, I, I think that you're great. I think that the Lord's got a great plan for your life. I want you to have every possibility to do anything that you want to do. So I want to pay for you to go get your PhD. And I was like, Whoa. Oh. Yeah, brother. Um, yeah. So, um, as strange as it may sound, I was like, I'm going to have to pray about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds real great, but I'm going to have to pray about it. So I did and asked for confirmation and, um, you, you know, checked out a few schools and came up to visit one here um, in New Orleans, which is actually where I'm at right now. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, and ended up coming up. Of course, I had to do my master's degree first, so did my master's degree. And then I'm up here working on the old PhD right now. Um, I'm here for the summer um, trying to prepare for what they call qualifying exams, which is three days worth of testing where they test you on basically everything you've learned um, so far in your program. You can take it at the about the halfway mark if you schedule things right. I didn't get mine in at the halfway mark, um, just kind of didn't work out with some scheduling stuff. So I'm about three quarters of the way done with my coursework. Um, so basically you sit down for three days and they test you over pretty much everything that you've covered in the program so far. Then when you pass that, you're in your senior residency, then you finish up a couple more courses. Then you do oral examinations where all of the other doctors at the institution sit down and there's no study guide and there's no preparation and they just basically grill you on whatever they want to grill you on. Then if you pass that, then you go to the dissertation phase and then you start writing your dissertation. And then they read that and they, you know, scrutinize that and try to rip that apart. Then you go in for your dissertation defense. Right. And then if you defend your dissertation successfully, then you're a doctor. So. A doctor of <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's where I'm at. I'm about, you know, three quarters of the way, I guess, through the program right now. So that's awesome. So and I mean, growing up, you just never had a plan for this. Never, which is why I, um, you know, to some degree feel like it's the right thing because it wasn't my, I wasn't seeking after this, you know, right. it kind of really just fell in my lap. Like the Lord opened the door in front of me and said, this is the way walk in it kind of thing. So, yeah. um, I did it. There was one moment when I was doing my undergraduate and I was in, I think it was a Romans class or something. And another reason I kind of didn't want to, I would have rather done a trade or something like that, which is why I became a firefighter. I was like, I don't know about going through school. Like I got to go to four years of college. That sounds terrible. I don't want to do all that. But then when I was doing my undergraduate and, you know, biblical studies, I was sitting there one day in class and I remember distinctly thinking to myself, I was like, if there was ever anything I think I could do for the rest of my life, I could study the Bible for the rest of my life. Wow. It's there you so go. rewarding and fulfilling. And I remember thinking that, and of course I never thought it would happen necessarily, at least not in the way that it has. But 
Um, the Lord kind of reminded me of that one day when I was up here for school many years later. Like, remember when you <laughs> remember when I heard the the whisper of your heart? Art, and it was it was really neat so that's awesome that's yeah. really cool you know it, you know the bible said, and now i'm gonna feel weird like quoting the bible to you because you're like probably <laughs> way more knowledgeable about it than i am but you know th- there's the conversation about you know the lord gives you the uh, uh the desires, desires the, of your heart right yeah. and then you know there's uh, there's the whole thing well does that just mean he gives you everything you want or does he have influence on what you want and you know i always find that a a, a fun uh, thing to ponder as we go through life and it turns out a little differently than we expected or we notice that our tastes have changed um yeah and, you know, like I said, I'm sure you could give me a lesson on that. But well, there's a I mean, there is a there is a fun little lesson. In it, and it's not whatever, not to be teacher or preachy, but it's, you know, delight yourself in the Lord. Yeah. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. And when you when you start delighting yourself in the Lord, then your desires line up with his. So right. he naturally starts to give you those things. I was talking to a really good friend of mine one time and he told me he was like, uh, he quoted that verse and he said, you know, what's really funny is I don't even know what the desires of my heart really are. Right. Because I have desires and then I get those things. You, you want the promotion, you want the job, you want the girl or you want the whatever and you get them and then you find them to be empty. And he's like, I don't even really know what, what my heart wants or what it needs, you know, and it's the Lord comes in and he kind of fills those things and then provides them for you and gives them to you. So yeah, it is, it's a really, it's a really cool thing being saved. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that's kind of like part of the problem of being a human being and, you know, theologians and philosophizers and, uh, you know, wise men over the ages from across cultures across the world. I mean, they've noticed the issue with knowing, I mean, knowing yourself enough to even know what you want, really, instead of, you know, wanting what you kind of are told is good or wanting what, uh, you know, what sounds cool. And you really don't even realize what you want until you get something. Um, anyway, so that's awesome. I love that. Okay, this is going to be fun. Um, now, so growing up, just, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, young people who listen to this show as well. Growing up, I mean, did you have something you wanted to be? Like, did you want to be a, a submarine commander like me or... <laughs> <laughs> was that your was that your there was, that was a fucking yeah, blood i know there was a period there where i really wanted to be a submarine commander and was like wow. looking at naval academies and stuff and man life would have turned out way different if i'd followed <laughs> through with that i'd say so yeah i think about that sometimes it really trips me out so i gotta think about something else but uh i mean wh- what was it what were you into uh, as a kid um, you know, when I was like, I guess, 13 years old, I guess maybe in seventh grade, I went on my first like youth, youth summer camp, you know, I don't know if you, you grew up in the oh, church, yeah, right? Of course. I think I've heard yeah. enough of your testimony. Yeah. To know. Um, but so I went, you know, and it was, you know, one of those awesome services and, you know, you know come make a commitment, you know, and do all the things. And I, you know, I really felt this burden on my heart. I was supposed to do ministry when I was like 12 or 13 years old, however old it was. And we came back from, you know, we came back from the camp and they put us in front of the church and, um, you know, you share your little testimony. And I told the whole church, um, yeah. that same church that I was at, I grew up at and became the youth pastor of that same church. I was like, I felt called to ministry and surrendering my life to ministry and did that whole, you know, and I'm 12 years old. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know right. what I'm doing. Right. Um, but that was, that was really on my heart. Um, wow. And then as I started to get older, all those things started to come in my mind. I don't know if I actually want to do this. Yeah. I'm not going to make any money. I don't want to go to school. And then I just started thinking about like, how can I make the most money I can make? You know, how can I make the most money? And, uh, I was going to college. I was at a community college there working on my AA. My buddy was selling phones and that was, I was like, that's, that sounds good. I was making like 
like $35,000 a year when I was, you know, 18, 19 years old, which at the time I was like, this is pretty good. I could do this. <laughs> but then you just end up finding out, you know, that you don't, that it's not fulfilling. Right, um, right. And that was when I started wanting something more. And then the Lord reminded me of ministry. And then I was like, I'm not doing that. And I was like, how about I'll compromise and I'll just go be a firefighter instead because then I'm helping people. <laughs> what a strange I'm compromise. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Lord got his way as he tends to do. So, yeah. um, no, there wasn't ever really, I didn't really have any clear, real clear plans for my life. So, um, I kind of just take it a day at a time and just trust that the Lord is going to have the next step prepared in front of me. And so far it's been working out all right. Hey, there you go. I'm kind of the same way. You know, you just take whatever, uh, the next step is and the, the, the the Lord takes it from there. And, yeah. uh, yep. Like you said, it tends to work out. Okay. And it's a lot less stressful in, in, than trying to figure out your whole life. It is. And on, on top of all of those things, um, after I finished my master's degree, I ended up getting hired on at the Bible college that I started at where I graduated from. And I'm, um, serving as a adjunct professor there. So, now I'm teaching, too, back at the school that I started at, which um, that didn't really like I didn't even, you know, go searching that out. That kind of just fell on fell on my lap again. So, yeah. the whole, you know, the whole thing just uh, has been. Has That's been really amazing. Incredible. I mean, and that w nice woman who <laughs> decided to take it upon herself to I mean, that's. That's the Lord used her in a life changing and possibly a world changing way. I mean, if it wasn't for her, you probably wouldn't be on this show right now. Yeah, that is that is true. Is this going out to the to the whole world? The entire world. Uh, we broadcast <laughs> to 187 countries on seven six continents. Uh, seven. We actually uh, we lost our licensing for Antarctica. So, but uh, I'm gonna go down there. I'm gonna talk to the the network heads all get us back. Don't worry. Good. Um, yeah. So Big anyways, down there. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. A lot of penguins. Um, <laughs> this show's huge with penguins. Um, anyways. Makes sense. Yeah. So I, I mean, I just find that incredible the way that the Lord uses people that way. Um, so now you mentioned you grew up in the church. I, you know, as someone who also grew up in the church, I tend to think of, that as normal as a normal childhood i'm you know the yeah. older i get the more i realize that it wasn't that normal um but you know was there anything remarkable going on there how was the family life brothers and sisters what do you what do you what do you got going on there uh i mean i hate to say there was nothing remarkable going on in the church it sounds it sounds kind of kind of uh terrible but it was a good it was a good church you know it was a pretty close-knit group of people and kind of you know becomes your family um in a lot of ways right. and um I, I guess i was the second of four children so my my older brother before me then me then there was a sister and then my younger viking brother who got all the viking blood <laughs> um so yeah, you know, my childhood was pretty was pretty normal. My parents uh divorced when I was in, I don't know, fifth grade or something. So that kind of uh you know, had some adverse effects on on the family. Yeah. Um I ended up actually um getting into uh, some pretty some pretty heavy drug usage when I was in my late teenage years, Classic. kind of senior year of high school. Right. Yeah. Um, As yeah, you were like pondering your future in the ministry. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it was actually, I ended up, uh, you know, I guess if any, I think, I mean, most of the people in my life know, but I ended up getting um, arrested. I took a bunch of uh, clonopins. It's like an anti-anxiety oh, pill. Oh, yeah. That's a real party. And you don't have to remember anything afterwards either. Precisely. <laughs> I forgot probably two or three days of my life. But um, the bits that I remember were cop knocking on the window of my car when I had crashed it into a curb and then 
um, trying to pass a, well, I did pass the breathalyzer test. They thought I was drunk, but I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And they're then, like, uh, something is up with this kid. <laughs> we can't prove it, but we know there's something. Yeah. Well, I, I gave them a full confession when they took me in. Um, oh, so yeah. I read that later on. My mom came, picked me up from jail, you know, all yeah, that. I mean, you're on that many, uh, anti-anxiety meds. You, you have no problem telling the cops the truth about anything they ask for. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everything is hunky dory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of after that. And of course I was, I was partying with my older brother. My younger brother ended up, um, getting into a lot of that stuff too. My sister was, you know, kind of the golden child. She ended up staying away from all of that. She was kind of the mother second mother to all of us really took care of us. But, um, it was a pretty, I, you know, I mean, most of the people that I know in my life went through the same sorts of things. So I consider it, uh, kind of normal. Um, <laughs> but then on the other hand, you know, not a lot of people mess around with illicit drugs to the point that they end up in jail, but more um, than you'd think, but less than the news wants you to know. Yeah. 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 So hearing Sean's testimony, you know, the other day, I was like, oh, man, I was a saint. <laughs> <laughs> I was such a good kid. <laughs> yeah. We love you, Sean. You make us all look like very good kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, OK. So, yeah. So, you know, not not a uh, coming of age without its excitement. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, and that's one of the other things, you know, that's, it's kind of, it, it gives you a little more confidence in sharing your testimony, because it's like, I did try, I did try the ways of the world, and I did try the things of the world, and I found them to be not fulfilling, you know, it's another one of those desires of your heart thing, like, it seems like what would be awesome is to go party every weekend, and take mind expanding drugs, and you know, to be drunk and to do all the things. And that seems like that will bring me happiness. And then of course it just never, it just never does. So, right. Right. You know, you can, and it's, I, I hate the fact that people feel like who came up in the church and who stayed away from all of that stuff, you know, they're like, I have a boring testimony. You hear people say that. Yeah. Um, I heard a pastor one time who said, I, I, pray that my kids have boring testimonies, uh. you know, <laughs> because it's not, it, you know, it's maybe not fun to necessarily stand up and it's not as cool as listening to these other people's crazy stories of deliverance that God brought them through. But it's the story of God's hand on someone's life to spare them from all of this. You know, you didn't have to learn these things the hard way. You rested in the shadow of his wing your whole life. And, you know, you've you've been with him and under his care. So and of course, you're under his care when you're out doing all of that other stuff anyway. But it's. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. No, absolutely. Totally. And, you know, what I find often, too, is people think they haven't had a remarkable testimony. And this is for all the people, all the good Christian kids out there who, uh, you know, feel that same way. But, you know, the more people I talk to, even the pe those who don't think they have a remarkable, remarkable story – you know, it seems that they tend to forget the exciting parts a lot of times or not think that they, uh, you know, measure up against the exciting parts of other people's stories. So um, but, you know, in the context of each person's life, you know, there are parts that we need to not leave out of the book. I'll tell you that much. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. OK. And and the. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you have something to add to there? Oh no, I was. I mean, I was just going to say that's one of the that's one of the great things about your about your show. You know what you're doing is it's like everybody you know gets a chance to to you know come on and and share those sorts of things. And they you know you don't know how much your story is as boring or as normal as you might think it is. You don't know how much it's encouraging somebody else. Oh yeah, um, to be sharing it. So and to hear somebody else tell a story that you're able to connect with. Uh, even amongst all of, you know, a bunch of other more exciting stories, the one that you connect with is the like the most powerful one. So I'm absolutely sure that uh, there there are those who are going to be very touched by this. So that being said, let's get on with the story. So uh, had some exciting times when you were coming of age, got in a little bit of trouble. Did you have to like do some court ordered uh 
<laughs> programs or anything as a result of that? Uh, I did. I had to do some community service, ended up doing some of that with a friend of mine who also was in trouble with the law. And we ended <laughs> up, you know, using drugs through our community service. We hadn't quite learned our lesson yet. Right. And they made me go to this counseling, whatever, this uh, AA meetings or something. And I remember sitting there for so many of the meetings and I was like, I'm not in it. This is dumb. I'm not an addict. I don't know why I'm here. All these people yeah. are terrible. I'm OK. I don't really have a problem. And then it was one of the last meetings ordered by the court. You know, I had to do seven or eight of them or something. And I was sitting there and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm an addict. Uh, oh, my yeah. gosh. Wow. And then I just had this little breakdown. Um, and that was when I kind of um, really was just like, I got to get off this stuff. And then, of course, you have to cut out all your friends, you know, all the people that you're, I mean, friends in quotations. Right. Because the only reason you're hanging out with them is to be using the drugs and then when the drugs are gone the friends are gone and they're not calling me they're not like dude are you okay right you were in the you were in jail we haven't seen you in a month how's it going you know they all just disappeared and then you know i found my you know my family back at the church um and all of that so yeah it was it was pretty easy the judge was the judge was pretty easy on me i didn't have to do any any jail time i just got like six months of probation or something and then Sure. Let go back into the world. So not um, quite like a life ruining situation, which is <laughs> nice. It was just a nice little wake up call there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that was exactly what it was. So it worked. It, it had its effect. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's For awesome. Sure. I mean, it's, it's nice to learn your lesson early. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. I, I know and Sean, I know that Sean is listening now and I'm sure he is happy to hear that you learned your lesson early. Yeah. So, yeah, there, I mean, there were some, you know, I have, I have some stories similar to his, but we'll, we'll, we don't need to, <laughs> we don't need to get into all of we'll that. We'll see. You know, we'll see dancing if we trolls get there. And stuff. <laughs> hey, you know, man, those uh, mind expanding drugs, they'll see some dancing trolls and stuff. Um, it's true. <laughs> it, it happens. <laughs> it happens. Um, well, that's awesome. And, you know, finding a home back in the church, definitely uh, as one who grew up in the church and went through some similar experiences in my coming of age times, um, it's a lot more impactful that sort of home that you feel in the church rather than, you know, the place that you've been forever. And now coming back, it's, uh, it's almost a refreshing sort of familiarity, huh? Yeah. It was one of the things that was really actually so cool about it. was, I remember, I mean, I felt like the prodigal, you know, I had grown up in the church. I had been there from the time I was five, up until I think I quit attending, you know, somewhere around I was 17 was when I started. I was like, I got my own car. I don't have to do whatever. I quit going, started hanging out, using drugs, doing all of that stuff. And I think it was, I was, you know, 19 or 20, I think, when I ended up um, getting into trouble. So I was away for, you know, about two years. And I knew, you know, that everybody pretty much knew what I was out doing and what I was about and what was going on in my life. And I remember when I was, you know, deciding that, I need to get back. I need to go back to church. And I remember the like certain shame that I was sure that I was going to face, you know, mm. walking back into the church after being gone for two years and yeah. just um, coming back. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to face it. And I had to muster, like, I felt like all this courage to walk back into church. And I remember walking back in that first Sunday and everybody was just like, Chris, how are you? <laughs> so happy to have so you back. It's so good to see you. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, it was just a picture of, it was just a picture of God's love. There was no, um, there was no judgment. There was no condemnation. And it really was, you know, it was a great homecoming. And, uh, you know, it brings that, the, you know, the parable um, of the prodigal kind of, you know, to new, light in your life and then of course whatever we're all we're all that person in yeah. one way or another but that was just my experience and my understanding of it so yeah sure and you know we're all the older brother in ways as well 
oh, this is true. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, this is true. We can go through uh, different periods in life where we can associate with all sorts of characters in that story. Yeah. Um, and so real quick, I wanted to mention, you know, because there's a big, um, you know, in the church today. And I'm curious as someone who is kind of participating in the Ph.D. program uh, of, uh, you know, biblical scholarship. I'm sure there's a lot of um, uh, uh, what's the word? Not investigation or critique or uh, I don't know. Discussion. Discussion. Yeah. About the. (laughs) Yes. Thank you for that. Very diplomatic way. Very diplomatic (laughs) way to put it, Um, you know, about, well, a the church and there's a lot of people and the church has sort of a reputation, especially in kind of the secular world of being abusive or being judgmental or being, um, you know, like a, a home until you don't follow the rules or something like that. Um, and yeah. there's, there's whole groups of people who are, you know, basically working through and kind of theorizing about that process uh, that people go through in the church, grow up in the church, and when the church doesn't live up to what it needs to be, which it sounds like, thankfully, it was to you, um, you know, they have to kind of destroy the church in their life, and they have to... Uh, find fellowship with others who have destroyed the church in their life. And so I'm just so thankful to hear stories of the church doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> and that is welcoming people back with open arms and and sort of avoiding the trauma that uh, is so popular to talk about in some Christian circles today. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to be, to be perfectly transparent, uh, there was there was lots of unhealthy um, behavior, kind of in that church um, as well. But sure. this is it's the nature of life. I mean, it's when you bring a bunch of humans together. It doesn't matter what they're doing. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be you know disunity. And this is you know this is the the high priestly prayer of Jesus. You know when he's praying and he's praying for the unity of the church and he's asking you know that God would make us one, even as He and the Father are one. And the appeal that should be there. I was just having a conversation with uh, one of the guys in my program the other day, and he was talking about um, kind of just how sometimes he thinks there's too much of an emphasis on evangelism and let me just i'll get to it um because that sounds terrible but it's not the church is not for the unbeliever um and this you know was this was kind of god's plan at least you can some people can interpret scripture this way i'm sure people might disagree and uh, have their interpretations but god chose a man he chose abraham and made a nation and he made a people out of him and he set them apart from the rest of the world. Mm. And they were supposed to operate within the bounds that God had created within, you know, his framework. And they were supposed to be a city on a hill. They were supposed to be a light to the rest of the nations that would draw other people unto themselves. Right. Right. So other people were supposed to be attracted to what was going on in the church. And the the church of acts was doing exactly that. I mean, yeah. They were living such a life that people saw them and were like, what's going on here? This seems cool. Yeah, they will know you by your love. (laughs) They will know you by the way that you treat each other. And then the problem is it doesn't matter, you know, what church you get into. When people start to treat it as a social club and when people start to treat it as a thing where – you know, you're putting your time in and you're doing this thing. And that's not to say that these people aren't saved and they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They probably do. But you start to, you know, it just becomes a thing that you do. You just go to church and then attitudes spring up and gossip happens and all of these. And everybody probably has a story about how they got burned by the church. But that is not the fault of the Lord. And it's not a reason to turn your back on him. And it's not a reason even necessarily to to leave the particular church that you're in. And the conversation I usually have with people is it's like, why don't you 
be a demonstration of what the person should be that you're mm. wishing that all these other people would be. So don't right. turn your back and reject all of these people, but be the change that you want to see, you know? And yeah. that's, a, that's a lesson the world knows. Hey, bro, you can't be quoting Gandhi around here. <laughs> what are they teaching you over there in those Ivy so, Towers? <laughs> the world knows that one. <laughs> that's true. Totally. I mean, it's an excellent point. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I don't know. Everybody's become so – we've become so comfortable and so complacent. And, I, you know, I don't see people a lot of times dying to themselves. And I, I don't see that thing happening a lot to where maybe the people are looking around like, what is going on? I mean, I have been parts of communities where that's where that's happened. But um, I think that's kind of the – there is there is hypocrisy in the church, you know, as much as you hate to say it, but there's hypocrisy in the world, too. I just read a right. quote from, oh, who was it? It just was making the rounds on Facebook. Um, but he said, you know, I, I hate when people say that the church is full of hypocrites because when I get up on Sunday morning and I show up for church, that is a confession to myself, to my family, to the world that I need help. As right. opposed to the man who's out playing golf on Sunday or who's doing whatever else and is basically saying, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, I don't need any, um, I don't need any help. I don't need change. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of, you can, you can, I mean, people looked at Jesus who was perfect and found a reason to condemn him and kill him. So yeah, certainly right. <laughs> us <laughs> who aren't, there's, there's any you know, number of reasons for people to look at the church and say that we're not living up to what we should be. And they're and they were calling him a hypocrite based on the religious expectations at the time. Right. You know, how dare he call himself, you know, I mean, even forget king of the Jews and son of God, but even a pious man when he's dirty and he's, you know, hanging out with bad people and he's you know what a hypocrite yeah. claims to p preach uh, you know god at the time in, in a, the jewish context and do these sorts of things but flying in the face of this you know what we know about this god he talks about preach razzle preach ma'am <laughs> yeah <laughs> um actually that, that that does bring up something i just did want to say which is um I've thought many times about uh, taking some classes at the local uh, – I don't even know what it is. I think it's a seminary. It might be a – I don't know. Yeah. Some, something rather where, like that. Where are you at exactly? I'm on the west coast of the United States, roughly. Roughly? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All I right. mean, the, there's uh, – yes. If I wanted to go to an institution, there are plenty of institutions around me that I could go to. Oh, say hi, cat. Um I don't know if the cat, cat came through the. I heard him. Came yeah. through. Okay, good. Um, good. Uh, <laughs> my cat's a star. Uh, anyway, so yeah, you know, I have often thought about that, and it kind of makes me think. You know, I'm like, why do I even think about that? Like, why is that something I even want to do? I I spend enough time talking to biblical scholars. Like, I probably should already have uh, some sort of degree. Um, yeah. Actually, funny thing that I wanted to mention, and another thing we have in common, well, kind of in common, is I have about nine-tenths of a uh, religious degree. And I say religious just because it's in the context of academia. Um, but I just never quite – it was on accident. I was <laughs> taking yeah. so, so many um, – you know, Greek courses and things like that, that I almost accidentally got a minor um, in religion. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't take much to go back and try to, to boost no, that up. Man. Yeah. There's probably a lot of places that would, that would transfer some of those credits in and you could, I mean, I, I know a couple people that are of like couple classes shy of finishing a degree and it's you know i encourage them all the time it's like man just go just do it and yeah. uh you never you never know you never know and if the desire is there in your heart yeah. perhaps it is the lord come on man stop uh <laughs> stop confirming <laughs> this there's so many pain there's in so the many butt places. process that god is calling me too, to do 
Um, I would say too, you know, that you don't like, you don't have to, you, I mean, you were, you probably do, um, you, you know, you probably undersold yourself a little bit earlier on whatever you're, whatever, talking about the Bible to to me or whatever. And it's like, there's, I know there's so many people, if you, you don't need, you don't need the, you know, um, the accreditation from, from people and from institutions to be a Bible scholar. You know, I, anybody can do it. It it might, (laughs) if for nothing else, it might help me have some credibility on Facebook. (laughs) <laughs> I could put that on my Facebook page. I don't know if I could go all the way and get the PhD so I could put Dr. Basil Rosewater. But uh, that sure would be an upgrade for the brand, I would say. Um, yeah. Man, I have so many questions. Okay, but I'm going to start broad and then we can work from there. I'm curious because I uh, I know a l- quite a bit of people who the more they learn about the Bible and everything surrounding it, um, and what I'm going to say is going to seem threatening to people who may not uh, quite understand where I'm coming from, but I'm just going to say it and then we'll work through it. Um It seems to me that the more people learn about the Bible and everything surrounding it, the Bible really changes for them and the way that they view the Bible, the way they view God, and the way they kind of operate in the world. Um, Because to – I'll say layman, but I mean that in the the most respectful sense, just for those who don't necessarily go to higher education – regarding the Bible, Um, you know, in churches and things like that, the very high regard, very high esteem for the Bible, but also, you know, oftentimes a a good amount of um, uh, ignorance is the wrong word, but I can't think of a better word about some of the finer details of the Bible that really um, change it in a very existential way compared to those who spend a lot of time studying it and its surrounding environs. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Have you experienced that? Can you speak to that a little bit? I would, yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, It is, uh, so the, the issue that you, that you run into as far as academics in biblical study versus my grandmother, who spends probably more time in prayer and in the word than myself, probably, and other people in my program. Yeah. Right. Uh, is that the the academic realm brings in a certain amount of credibility, right? So you you go to a guy like Dr. Heiser. Yeah. <laughs> and he is his opinions carry, they carry more clout. They carry more, they carry more weight uh, because you know that he's spent the time studying these things and digging them out. And then he'll come across and say these strange things, you know, that some, like my grandmother or your aunt or whoever, you know, he'll make comments about how, well, this is how this is generally interpreted, but it's definitely not what it means. And then it like turns everybody's world upside down. What are you talking about? And I remember sitting in some classes, you know, um, early on and they, you know, start bringing up questions about like, well, should we take Genesis literally, you know, is, is Genesis one to be interpreted literally and uh, coming up in just a good old conservative Christian background, I'm like, of course it's, what are you talking about? Of course it's literal. That's what the Lord said. That's what he meant. Um, and then the more you start to understand, you know, this is, it's a, you know, it's an expression of a person's heart with the sovereignty of the Lord's ordaining of their words over top of it. And it's, you have to, you have to understand what it is you're reading and it doesn't necessarily always translate exactly the way that you, that you thought that it would. And this is the, you know, this is like, hermeneutics 101 this is the thing that they start to teach you yes is that you're you're a 21st century american reading you know an ancient near eastern document at that the was, peak of american empire 
And, right. <laughs> right. Right. And one of the so one of the uh, one of the classes that I teach at, at Trinity College there is is a hermeneutics class, right? So it's how, which is if you I'm sure you know, but if people don't know, it's just it's just a fancy word for interpretation. So how do you interpret the Bible? Yeah. And you come to all of these various passages, and one of the ones that I use in my class just as a just as a standard. Let's look at this and understand how people in the first century would have understood this as opposed to how we understand it. And it's uh, Revelation chapter three, when, um, you know, Jesus is is speaking through John to the church at Laodicea. And it's that whole, um, uh, well, I'll just read it so I don't, you know, misquote the whole thing or That's whatever. But smart, smart, it's, my friend. Uh, so to the angel of the church in Laodicea, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So <laughs> we read that in the way that, you know, I had always previously understood that before I come start studying the Bible. Um is that it's, you know, we we understand that, I guess, in our American sense that hot is good and cold is bad, right? right? So, like, right. you're on fire for Jesus or you're cold towards Jesus. Yeah. And and he's saying, you're on the fence, so I wish you were either on fire for me or you just made up your mind and you hated me. And you read that and it's kind of like, why would Jesus say that I that I wish you hated me? Mm -hmm. instead of that I wish you loved me. And then you come to, you start looking at the context in, into which this was written, and then there's all of this uh, the surrounding information. So when you start digging that stuff up, you understand that there were these uh, two other churches in the area, well, two other cities at least. There was um, Hierapolis, I believe. I'm not sure if there was a church there or not, but then there was Colossae down below them, definitely a church there. And Hierapolis had these naturally occurring hot springs where this hot water came. It was kind of like a hot tub for, the, you know, the ancient world, the first century people. They had this natural hot tub, had all these minerals. They believed it had these kind of healing qualities and properties to it. And it was something of a, of a luxury because it was people love hot tubs. You know, we love hot tubs now. We get them built in our – true. We've loved and, them since the beginning. <laughs> And we'll love him right up until the end when Jesus comes back. I hope I'm in a hot tub when Jesus comes back. <laughs> and then in Colossae, they had these naturally occurring cold springs, which in the ancient world, cold water was something of a luxury. You didn't have refrigerators. You didn't have ice cubes and freezers. So they had – what he was doing was pointing to the thing that they were lacking. So it was not this – when you read it, it's not Jesus saying, like, I wish you were on fire for me or that you hated me. Basically, what he's saying instead is you think that you have, he goes on to say, you know, you you have these fine garments and you have this gold and this salve for your eyes. But here's one thing that you don't have. Here's the thing that you're missing, which is this basically source of living water, if you will. Right. Um, and then he points that thing out. So it's this whole sort of just from one little verse like that, you can see that this whole kind of paradigm shift comes to how you're interpreting and understanding the Bible. And that's kind of more of like a peripheral issue. But then you start to go to how people are translating and interpreting Genesis and how old is the earth and is the earth 6,000 years old or is it millions of years old and sure. is it day a day in Genesis? And what does it mean that the earth was without form and void there before day one even happens and all of these sorts of things. And it really starts to turn your world upside down. Yeah. And the ability for you to kind of just take the word as it's spoon to you by your pastor, who maybe is doing a good job studying and researching and preparing to, to feed the people, or maybe he's getting his sermon from some online resource somewhere and just taking <laughs> Who knows? I mean, well, it happens. <laughs> it happens right, a lot more than people realize. It absolutely does. So, you know, the, the example of the Bereans that you go and you study these things for yourselves and it feels so daunting to a lot of people. And it used yeah. to feel daunting to me because it's like, well, how, do I, how am I supposed to know about Hierapolis and yeah, Colossae and all right. of these things? But if, if we spent as much time 
studying the word and in the word as we did whatever the other things we're doing in our lives, yeah. the social media and all of the other time wasters that the beast system keeps on just putting in front of us to just suck all of our life away, then, you know, we would have, we would have a clear understanding of all of these. Totally. Things. And, and, and you know, the, the, one of the things that I found is, I mean, with a lot of the traditional sort of teachings, for instance, about the passage that you read about the hot and the cold and the lukewarm, I mean, the, you know, the sort of uh, mainstream teaching of that passage does fire people up. And I believe in many, many cases does kind of fire people up to make, you know, more uh, uh, passionate commitments to Christ and uh, (laughs) activates, you know, good work for the kingdom, you know, on the earth. And so, you know, I, I think both of us are on the same page to say that it's not necessarily like you don't live a good Christian life by maybe not having, you know, a, a f- comprehensive uh, understanding of the hermeneutics of that passage. But right. it does leave you with strange questions like, well, why would Jesus rather I hate him than love him a little bit? You know, like, exactly. cause it doesn't, when you really think about it, and that's certainly a passage that I, you know, before my minor education in, uh, you know, biblical studies, you know, that is definitely a passage that would be troublesome. And what I've seen in the past is when you get enough of those little things piling up, that's when you start to have an issue because then when, you know, I don't know if an atheist or a, just a secular humanist or something comes to you and says, you know, I don't know, p- points out sort of a, a weird aspect of God's character. For instance, why would he rather you hate him? rather than just love him a little bit, you know, that just doesn't make a lot of sense really in our understanding. And you just don't have anything to say about it. I mean, there's, there's not really a mainstream Christian scriptural reference to defend the stance that Jesus would rather you hate him than love you a little bit. Uh, I I mean, if you're going to put it on a scale of things Jesus likes more than other things, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense that he would rather you hate him than love him a little bit. Now, yeah. I'm sure somebody out there has a great sermon to defend that. I'm not trying to make overarching statements, but you know, it, it just complicates well, the, the average Christian's defense of the faith. Yeah. It, it I, you're right. And the, the, question i think that the, w- one of the best points that you brought up there was you made a lot of great points but w- Thank you. <laughs> one of the ones that Thank resonated you. with me the most was you come to these what they call problem passages or whatever um these different things and sometimes it's a problem in scholarship and everybody reads it and they don't know how we should interpret this and sometimes it's just a problem for you like sometimes you right. just read it and you're like i don't understand this right well the thing that happened in my life was I actually had, um, my best friend, my whole, my whole life, um, while we were, we grew up in the church together and then we were using drugs together in our teenage years. And he ended up kind of walking away from the church. And when I came back to the church, he never did, but I stayed in, you know, close relationship with him. He's, he's a brother to me. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, started like, you don't really believe all this stuff, do you? Like, you can't really, you know, like, what about this? And he'd ask me this question. And he'd ask me this question. And I'm like, man, those are great questions. And those are questions that I have myself. But I don't, you know, I don't know what the answer is. And I got tired of telling him, I don't know what the answer is. Mm. And I have the Internet. Right. <laughs> right. My, which is a good thing or a bad thing. Sure. But you have access to, you know, what what on earth does that mean? And if you take the time and you come to these difficult things, um, and, and you don't just settle on, well, I don't really know what that means, and on to the next verse, but you meditate on those things, um, then this is when God starts opening up, you know, it's wherever it is, it's um, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of a man to search it out, right? So yeah. God, 
puts these mysteries either about himself, and sometimes it's not intentionally a mystery. Sometimes it's just you have to put yourself in a first century mindset to understand these things. But there's such a great, it's like mining for treasure every time that you go and study the word and you just start pulling out these nuggets. And it was actually John MacArthur was the first one that I started. And I know he's he's really polarizing, so I'm not like a MacArthur right. I don't stand by everything that he said, but that was the first time I was exposed to expositional preaching. And I was like, what is this man doing? <laughs> lucky, Every- for, lucky for you. I have no strong feelings about MacArthur whatsoever right now. So you're safe. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> it was his, uh, Gosh, I'm trying to remember. I think maybe one of the first things that I listened to him do was his actually his teaching on the prodigal and the way that he just unfolds the whole thing about, um, you know, what all of that would have meant, like what it means for a son to ask for his inheritance early from his father and the implications of that in the ancient Near East and what it means for him, for this Jewish boy to run off into this Gentile country and the, the the way that the story just builds, and then like you had said about the older brother, and that we're all the older brother sometimes, and what the the character of the older brother, where sometimes you think, gosh, he's the one who was staying at home and obeying and doing all of these things, but then no, he was actually in many ways worse than than the younger brother. Right. And when he started unpacking all of that stuff, and I was like, the the Bible is such an incredible masterpiece that has been constructed and it's there for all of us yeah. for all of us to dive into and you don't have to come do it at you know some kind of institution you can do it right there in your house but it definitely starts to <laughs> it turns your world upside down when right you bring it into the world of of academics and peer review and all of those things and it definitely puts a different slant on it so that leads me to my next question which is um, you know, uh, ch- not even challenging. Challenging is not even the right word. Uh, uh, presenting additional information to the mainstream teachings um, of the Bible that you could find in any church on any given Sunday morning is very threatening to a lot of people. And I don't even blame them for that. Uh, just because... What types of additional information are you? What well, do you mean? for instance, with uh, what you're talking about, just the hot and cold thing. We'll talk. We'll talk there. So, uh, a, a preacher comes up teaching the classic hot and cold, lukewarm, spit you out of my mouth thing. The uh, right. you got to be passionate, or he would rather you hate him. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of times, I mean, if you bring, uh, you know, kind of the more academic hermeneutics to that where hey it's not about necessarily not being cold but it's about you know everything you just said i'm not going to try to re <laughs> redo that um you know because it's outside of the oftentimes decades and decades of you know you'll hear that teaching quite a few times if you spend a couple decades in the church um but sometimes, I won't even say all the times, and this can be applied to a lot of other stories as well, it's th- it's a little threatening to have a story that you've been told over and over and over and with an attached teaching that you are prescribed to live your life by. It's threatening when that gets tweaked and you're told maybe it's not necessarily what it's about you know, what you think it's about and people become defensive. And my question for you is specifically, because this is about you. um, (laughs) When you began this journey of learning more about the Bible than uh, I certainly probably do, did you ever find your good church kid, uh, identity threatened by some of this stuff um or was yeah. it scary you know yeah that oh, kind of yeah. stuff yeah lots of times um and the first one i mean was the first time i was exposed to uh i guess what you might recall call reformed 
doctrines or, you know, Calvinism or whatever that sort of thing. And I have a professor who's just dogmatically just going after Calvinism and all the five points. And, oh, interesting. You know, if you're, I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, fully aware of, of the teaching. And he's just like, you know, you're, you're predestined before the foundations of the earth. And if God didn't pick you for heaven, then you're destined to hell and it doesn't have anything to do with you and, and all. And it just over the top with this sort of thing. And I'm sitting there like, this can't possibly be right. Like this can't, this can't actually be the way that it is. And it does, it, it, it causes you to kind of draw back and to almost recoil. And that's one of the more polarizing sorts of issues. Like that's one of the ones that really, that really, you know, people's claws come out and in teaching. So I teach a, a theology class also, and we cover soteriology and we cover Calvinism and Arminianism. And it happens every time. Yeah. Every time there's people in the class that are Calvinist and people that are Arminian, and then they start sparring. And your job as the professor is not to stand there and to, you know, espouse a particular doctrine, but it's to get people to start thinking about these things for themselves and to start understanding just because this is the way that you were taught since you were a kid and you grew up in this particular church, you need to not be threatened by different opinions. And that right. was one of the things that I had to come to on my own, you know, is it's like, I didn't even want to think about like what carbon dating. Oh my God, there's carbon dating. The earth is, they, they say the earth is however, 300 million years old. I don't even, I don't even want to look at carbon dating because then what's going to happen. And it's the more that you just like, well, God, I'm going to take you at your word. And this thing is either what it is or it's, or it's not what it is, but I'm going to, I'm going to face it head on. I'm going to keep an open mind about all of these things. And I'm going to understand that if a particular doctrine that I've learned or a particular teaching that I've learned happens not to be the thing that I thought that it was, it's okay. Yeah. God's still on the throne. Right. I'm still saved. And, but you do get a lot of, like one of the ones that I keep on hearing, you know, so much, even especially right now is that second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Right. And you, you look around at the world right now, you look around at the United States and people start calling for people to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is, this is a promise in the Bible. And it's like, well, you come back to, to 101 of hermeneutics, which is the, the immediate context. And that promise was not given to the 21st century United States. That promise was given to Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you can't, you may be able to look at that and find some truth. Like, yes, yeah, certainly if we're, if we're humble, and if we're repentant, and if we come before God, then he's, then he's merciful towards us. But he's not promising us that he's going to heal our nation. Mm. That's not the promise. So all of the Christians in the United States of America, we could all fall on our face and start praying and start pleading and start repenting. But God's will could still be to destroy the United States. So that's, you know, you, you, you have to be careful because if a pastor stands up and preaches, this is a promise of God for your life for you. Yeah. This is what God promises, but he wasn't talking to you. He was talking to David. Right. And You're, because he was talking to David. You better be careful, boy. You start uh, threatening American nationalism. You're going to have some trouble on your hands here in the church, boy. Yeah. Well, my church has heard it already. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me the pulpit a time or two. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is, you know, and I, it's, that's not just with, that's not just with the Bible. That's with anything, yeah. anything that you know in your life that you've held to be true when it gets upended, you, you start to feel insecure. You start to feel like your world's coming unraveled. And mm. that's like, this is why you have to major on the majors and you have to major on Jesus on redemption through his death on the forgiveness of sins yeah. on your salvation and your relationship with him. And then all of this other stuff, it's not that it's not important, but there's, there's some wiggle room there so that if one of the things that you've understood for a long time to be just such a way, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the accuracy of God's word. It doesn't take right. away from your relationship with him and all of that. So I would encourage, I guess, whatever, anybody who's listening. I mean, yeah. if you hear something that, that feels threatening, take it to the Lord in prayer. Go there yourself. Read it. Um, 
there's plenty of free resources out there online. Anybody, yeah. anybody can be a scholar. You can go to uh, 10 different websites and, you know, look at, and of course, whatever. But and, my, and if learning more about the Bible and committing yourself to the scriptures, whether they match what you've been taught or not, is threatening to you and your faith, you're already re- reading the wrong Bible. Like, you need, we got to understand that looking deeper into the scriptures it should not be a threat to our faith. And if things, you know, have uh, understandings that we are, were before, you know, unaccustomed to, and that threatens us. I mean, you're safe studying the Bible and trusting that and, you know, coming to the conclusions that, you know, the Bible was written for. And, uh, yeah, you know, and and it can be scary. And you will probably find some things that go against something you were taught in Sunday school. I mean, that's (laughs) that's guaranteed. I'm just guaranteeing it right now. The the more that you do that, you're going to find that things aren't what you were taught in Sunday school. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean, like you said, that the major parts of it, uh, you know, the the main existential uh, uh, effects and promises of the scripture, it doesn't mean that those aren't true. It just means that, uh, you know, y- y- it's God's word. And if you believe that that is true, then you need to trust what comes out of that. I don't know. I found it very Absolutely. freeing. Um, no, it, you're right. It is. And that's when it that's when it starts to open up so much of the beauty and the mystery and the majesty even that people are missing is is because you come to these scary precipices. I don't know if that's the plural. I've never tried to use the plural. <laughs> Precipi. Uh, you Ha-ha. come to them. We got you, you, to, you, you got smarty me. pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you stand there and you look over and it's terrifying and you don't you don't continue to move forward in it. And that's the thing is it's like you ju- just take the plunge, man. Yeah. Just just put your whole faith and your whole trust in God and in his word and and go after it. And don't be concerned if somebody has a different opinion um, than you do. You know, I mean, there's there's issues. There's issues of heresy where, you know, you will have to, you know, you end up having to kind of take a stand on some things. And it's like you can't. You can't can't just let people espouse heresy all over the place. But then there's like, you know, whatever. Was I chosen before the foundations of the earth and it's beyond my control? Or do I have a free will to choose God or whatever? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> right. In a pragmatic sense, that question is not very practical to to really uh, spend too much time worrying about. But Well, that's the one that, that occupies so much of – the theological debate is the Calvinism and Arminianism. Oh, don't I, mean, I know people it. just get, they just get hung up on that one. And it's like, yo, listen, doesn't matter. Right. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, a either way, choose whether you were predestined or you have free will to choose salvation. Either way, how does that change the way that you live your life? I mean, yeah. how are you going to know if you weren't chosen you're 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 still should be compelled to follow Christ either way. And if you're compelled, then, you know, if we're ascribing to Calvinism, if you're compelled, then you were chosen. And in free will, even if you weren't chosen, you should feel compelled and continue moving forward with that. Yeah. And this is and this is what I would just I guess maybe kind of one further point on this before we maybe. Yes. Shift move gears, on. But certainly. You need to. You need to engage yourself with people who disagree with you and you need to Thank like you. if you hear something that sounds fishy, yes. then go go search it out and don't just stay with, you know, the one or two preachers that you that, you know, if I only ever listened to John MacArthur, my my theology would be vastly different than it is now, you know, but right. you, you search it all out and you hear something that sounds crazy don't just write it off and don't just write the person off you don't Um, just call him a heretic and move on post you know heretic on facebook and then bail absolutely but this is but this is the so i have so i have a professor who um i brought up an issue 
in class, right? So I had kind of asked him a particular question about how do you feel about this this thing, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And it was it was about the woes to the to the Pharisees. Yes. So um, there's there's seven woes that are recorded for the Pharisees. There's eight beatitudes. There's a textual variant where there ends up being eight woes, right? So I asked him because I was like, what do you think about this textual variant? Do you think that this thing belongs there or not? There's lots of textual variants that um, I was listening to the uh, Canary Cry radio that you had Anthony Patch on yeah. that whole thing with the geomancy. Yes. With uh, in, in John six was, I was like, Whoa, fascinating. But I brought that up to somebody today as I was studying and he just kind of scoffed, you know, he was <laughs> like, and I was like, well, you know, I don't like, I don't know. It sounds weird, but I think he had some, you know, peer reviewed stuff that we could look at, mm-hmm. but, um, it's, it's something, you know, that's been added in there. So some people are like, is it inspired? Is it not? Whatever. There's this eighth woe. And if there's eight woes, they kind of parallel the AP attitudes, right? So I ask my professor, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this eighth woe? Do you think that that thing's actually there? Or is that a, is that a textual variant? And he, and he just kind of pauses for a second, and he's like, no. And then he just moves on. And I was like, well, you know, and I look over at my buddy, and I was like, dude, I was like, what? he didn't even – he didn't even give me a minute. Like he didn't even explain anything. And he was like, dude, he just sat there and went through probably about 10 different books that he's read all of these different resources. Mm -hmm. And he basically was like, he was like, no, like I've, I've looked at this. I know this. And, and that's not the way that it is. And then he, and then he moved on. So there's, there's, times i think and there are occasions where you can you can offer a short answer and you can offer a simple no and then you know you you express an opinion about something and you move on um, and <laughs> facebook lessons from uh, the seminary there <laughs> or yeah. am i using the right word when i say seminary or is it something else i i is seminary it mo- is it is okay it's a seminary. I didn't know if that was like specifically geared towards, I don't know, those going into active ministry or if, I don't know, some there's some sort of academic difference. But Well, most of the time when I say seminary, people think I'm a Catholic and they think I'm right. studying to be a priest. Oh, sure, um, sure. So I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I've always, I've always just understood it to be, yeah, yeah, training for pastors. But there's lots of people who aren't going to be um, in the pastorate who are here. Right. Okay. So all very fascinating and all very fun to geek out about as far as theology goes. And uh, I find it uh, we're we're definitely going to do some more talking about that, perhaps off air, in case there's anybody who's just tired of hearing theology nerds. Um, go on about stuff. Um, so here is my question for you. Let me pull this up. Yep. Okay. We're at about an hour and a half. So, wow, this is going by fast brother. Um, now where and how in the world do you go from good church boy, uh, to, you know, studying biblical scholarship And where does Canary cry and conspiracies and prophecy and the Nephilim? Well, now, as I'm saying it out loud, I think I know how this is going to go. But how did that come into the picture? It's, you know, a lot of (laughs) scholars and academics, you know, with very notable exceptions, don't spend a lot of time on the types of stuff we talk about on Canary Cry Radio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well... Uh, the Nephilim was definitely a point of entry for me. I knew it. I <laughs> knew <sure>. it. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, that's one, that's one of those things you read the Bible and you come to a text and you look at it and you're like, what the heck Yeah. does that mean? And then you either keep on moving on and you read the next verse or you spend some time looking into it and then you read it and it's like, gosh, that sure sounds like that sure sounds like this is what's going on. So I started doing, you know, my own whatever independent internet research on that. And then yeah. of course that just opens the door to all of all sorts crazy of things. <laughs> <laughs> podcasters. <laughs> um, 
And uh, the first one, you know, that I came across was was Steve Quayle. Um, and Steve Quayle, you know, he's uh, I I love most of the work that he does. He's a little bit a little bit polarizing for me, but he's definitely made some great contributions to the discussion. I prefer the approach of Mike Heiser, who I didn't find till, you know, sometime later. Um, but it was kind of through Steve Quayle, ended up finding a YouTube video. He was giving an interview, I think, on the Hagmans. And then, uh, and this was before, um, I had finished my bachelor's, but it was before my master's degree. So, um, there was there was that I started looking into that and then I started listening to the Hagmans and the Hagmans, you know, the Hagmans are whatever the Hagmans are. They're a little sure. bit brash, too, I think, um, from time to time. But they provide, you know, a lot of great resources for people. They have a lot of great guests on that sort of thing. They're they're. I don't want to I'm not trying to say anything bad about them. Sure. But they, you know, they they're different than you guys, for sure. And then end up finding, you know, all kinds of different um all kinds of different uh, podcasts. I ended up finding you guys. I think I did some search for a particular guest and they came up on your show. And then of course I listened to you guys and you guys are in my personal and humble opinion, the best in the best in the business um, because you, you don't sensationalize stuff. You don't, you just like report the facts. You're just like, here, listen to this story. This is published in, you know, this particular journal and listen to the things that are going on all around us. And it doesn't have to turn into any, you're just putting things in front of the people. And this was one of the things for me, one of the other things that brought me into, if you want to call it the conspiracy realm was actually um, listening to thrice. Did you ever listen to thrice? Yes, of course. The band? G yeah. Gonza and I, yes. I know that uh, he was in some kind of band or something, wasn't he? Some kind of like screamo or something? Band? Yes, very much kind of in the vein of Thrice. Yeah, yeah. So they did the Alchemy Index. You remember the Alchemy Index? Um, you know, I was never a, a fanboy. So I couldn't, I couldn't okay. even, I, could, I couldn't give you the lore on Thrice, but I'm familiar with which you speak. I geeked out on Thrice, and they had one of what I think was one of the most brilliant albums that they put together. It was called the Alchemy Index. They released it in four EPs. Each one of the EPs was titled after one of the elements: fire, water, air, and earth. And there were six tracks on each, and they'd have five tracks. And then the sixth track on each one of them was a sonnet written from the perspective of the element, like two people. So the sixth yeah. track on the fire was like from fire to people. Um, and it was it was just – it's brilliantly done. You should Everybody should go check it out. But the first track on the Air album was um, – uh, what was it? Oh – I don't remember the title of it. I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but um, it was about 9-11. It was about the 9-11 cover-up. Oh, right, right. And I remember listening to that, and this was back in like 2007, 2008 something, and I respected them so much as artists, and I respected them as believers and the, the stuff they were putting out, and I thought that they were so incredible, and I just loved them. And then I hear this, and at the time I was one of those people who had heard the the truthers and all of this, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Like, it's a government was behind nine. Like, get out of here! Like, you guys are nuts. Um, and then I hear Thrice putting this song out there, and I'm like, I'm like, what on earth? Like, you guys are smarter than this. Come on, this is dumb. <laughs> and then. Uh, I, you know, taking the my own advice that I had been giving just previously about looking into these things when somebody presents something, you go check it out, go look into it. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch Loose Change and I'm just I'm, no preconceptions. I'm just going to watch it. This is right around the same time that I was uh, starting to listen to Steve Quayle and all that. So I sit down and I watch Loose Change and I'm like. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is, there's definitely something more going on here than what we've been told. Like, this is crazy. And then, you know, you, so then you kind of start like asking questions and you start trying to go to find more answers. Just like it, you, 
like curious people tend to do. I consider myself to be a curious person. And um, you start to find out that there's <laughs> this whole world of things going on all around you that you have absolutely no conception of and no idea about. Right. And um, that was kind of, that was kind of, it was the Nephilim and it was 9-11 that really kind of dragged me into um, these sorts of things where I started asking even, even deeper questions, not just about the Bible, but about how all of this stuff is, is coming to fruition. And then of course you read Revelation and um, the big, the big topic as far as eschatology goes at, at the seminary, at the academic level is in regard to the pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill kind of discussion. If you're familiar with that whole thing, I'm sure yeah, you are. Yeah. And, uh, in the academic community, the impression that I get from most of the people as I talk to them is most of the people are oh, millennial. Well, we're getting back on this theology thing again, but um, <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm sorry. Um, most of the people are amils, oh, you know, and you kind of there's a lot of reasons to really understand that Revelation was written to the first century church concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, and they make really compelling points. And I listen to you know, my professors who kind of lean towards amillennialism, I listen to other students, other people, and it's like, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But it doesn't still take away from the fact that that it could have been essentially typological, if you will, the, the first occurrences that happened, and that there's still a greater fulfillment of the book of Revelation to come. And that's kind of, you just start looking around at the world, and it's like this stuff at some point stops becoming a conspiracy theory and you just can't deny what's happening, you know, all around you, all over the place. And this is why I love to come to you guys and I love to come to whatever the Hagman's, uh, true news. I listen to, you know, I dabble in, in pretty much all of them from time to time. Um, and, uh, I don't have the time to sit down and to look through all of these news articles and the things like you guys do and to bring it all together. But, that's why I appreciate and value you guys so much. And I'll just go ahead and throw it out there right now. If anybody's listening, like if you listen continually and you're not giving at least a little bit to, you know, what you guys are doing, you should do it. Attaboy. I mean, you guys are doing, you guys are doing a lot of great work. I started supporting on Patreon. I don't know how long ago because I was just like, I, I am receiving so much from the hard work that you guys are putting in mm. and I don't have the time. I don't have the time to sit down. And I don't even know where you guys find all of this stuff. Like I visit Drudge, you know, but Drudge is not. And then, of course, if you ever watch the cable news, that stuff's just a joke. I right. Mean, that's just yeah. a, that's just a shouting match between CNN and Fox all day long. It's it's ridiculous. They're not even getting to the actual issues. Right. Right. Well, thank you very much. I pre I mean, it means a lot to hear that. And, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in taking you up on uh, that offer, pa <laughs> patreon.com slash Canary Cry Radio, patreon.com slash CCNT, patreon.com slash The Joy Spiracy Theory. Don't forget about that one. Um, yeah, well, th thank you very much. I mean, that uh, it is nice to be affirmed in that, uh, especially when we're <laughs> being a podcaster by trade. You question your choices pretty often, uh, but it's incredibly <laughs> rewarding. And so thank you very much for that. Well, yeah, I mean, and I, um, I actually was kind of wondering, I was going to ask you, um, a little bit because uh -huh. I mean, maybe with some of the remaining time that we have here, um, sure. what just kind of like, what, I mean, what do you find as far as you have a lot more exposure to, um, I would probably say the community of people, I guess, maybe uh -huh. then, I mean, it's like when you're an individual like I am and you're yeah. not, you know, one of the people who's producing the content necessarily. And it wasn't, you know, necessarily until just recently, even, you know, the Facebook community develops all of these different things. And, you know, you start to look in there and you're like, wow, there's a bunch of really, strange people <laughs> <laughs> that, 
that makeup. <laughs> like, and uh, I, I count myself in there. No, I mean, yeah, I, totally. I wrote one of my seminar papers on Genesis chapter six, defending the position that the sons of God in Genesis chapter six were fallen angels uh-huh. um, and presented that. I actually sent an email to Dr. Heiser um, in preparation for that paper. And I said, hey, listen, I'm going to try to write this paper and I'm going to present it. And I really want to make sure that <laughs> I don't sound like an idiot in front of everybody. Um, so if you could give me some help. And he pointed me to some really great resources. Um, I was really appreciative. But I mean, everybody in my everybody in my seminar looked at me like, are you serious? <laughs> like, are you, you really you really believe this? And I kind of find that as I'm going around in my life, like, you know, I you talk to your family or you talk to your friends and you're like, listen, the go- like the government's seriously watching you. Like it's not even, <laughs> it's not even a question anymore. I mean, whatever television company it was that got busted for looking into people's living rooms, you got Facebook that basically just came out and openly said, yeah, we're collecting, we're mining your data. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not even a conspiracy anymore. It's just fact. And you start to share that with people and they look at you like you're crazy. So when I say the community of people draws, it draws all kinds of weird folks in there. I count myself as one of the, as one of the weird folks. Yeah. But what do you, first, how do you approach your, your friends and your family being, because however well-versed you might think I am in the Bible, you are far more well-versed in I would say current events, especially the way, you know, things that are going on that you guys cover Bitcoin yeah. and AI and all of these things all the time. So how is it you talk about upsetting a person's worldview and teaching a Bible passage a little bit differently? How do you find it <laughs> to be when you upset a person's worldview by like yeah. everything you believe is a lie? And yeah. well, I'm in a very privileged position. And that position is that I have a community that has uh, that uh, that has gathered around me uh, by God's grace that affirms me exploring these topics, um, which gives me an opportunity to explore ideas, share ideas and um I mean, oftentimes even really go off the deep end. Uh, now, a lot of th- nowadays I kind of do it m- more for fun. I mean, when I go far off the deep end, it's really um, out of habit more than anything else. And I try not to go far off the deep end <laughs> too often. But when I'm there, you know, the people who listen to me understand that. And many of our listeners have been listening to uh, Gons and I for years and years. Um and they listen to us without being able to respond to us right away uh, with the podcasts and, and you know the the online presence. So I'm privileged to have this outlet. Um, so my strategy that's developed over the years comes from that point. Now that being said. Um, I do still oftentimes in life get the opportunity to or feel the urge to share sort of the weirder stuff with people that I know and love. Uh, And my strategy has been not to try to take it upon myself to awaken them to what's going on, but rather when something comes up, I will say it in a way um that uh is more like a f- a lure like a fishing lure i'll go fishing for people who are interested in this sort of stuff i've come to the conclusion that that's different from trolling right yes <laughs> it's different from trolling it's called luring and so you know in real life when i'm out with friends or with family or just in a crowd of people socially um, instead of, you know, taking it upon myself to awaken them, the, for instance, that 9-11 was an inside job, I get the opportunity to just sort of drop a little f- funny thing in a funny way regarding 
you know, 9-11. I'm just using 9-11 as an example. You know, so I don't know if if the subject comes up, you know, maybe I'll say like, you know, I don't know. And all that pesky thermite that the the terrorists had, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and which means nothing to people who aren't interested. You know, sure. somebody who's not interested will totally not pay attention to me and we'll just keep going and be like wow that is a weird kid <laughs> what is he talking about i don't care i'm gonna go about my day but those who are interested in god has sort of already been leading on the journey of awakening to some of the more truthiness going on in the world they will ask questions and they you know i've got them hooked and from there um you know i uh, give them the link to my patreon and then, uh, <laughs> um, no, no. So, you know, it's more of that, but uh, that's also, do you ever find yourself in, in, in situations though, where a, a conversation comes up or something happens and yeah, you just can't let it go. Do you know what <sighs> I mean? Where, where yeah. you, you just have to, you just have to jump in. You just have to. So the biggest one that I can't let go is when things get super partisan, um, specifically like Republicans versus Democrats. And, you know, I obviously, as we all well, do, if you're a Christian, you're obviously a Republican. <laughs> well, right, exactly. <laughs> and so it's more that kind of stuff that I really can't shut my mouth about. I'm very, very good at not blurting things out about UFOs or Nephilim or, <laughs> you know, any uh, Alistair Crowley. I do. Oh, and this is a fun one. I actually, I love pointing out um, occult stuff in the media and, you know, oh, even yeah. even architecture and stuff like that. I've I got, taught a whole series at my church on that. I took yeah. them a whole Thursday night study. It was – they all hated me because they <laughs> couldn't watch anything or listen to anything anymore. I was like, sorry, guys. That's – yeah, that's kind of a fun, fascinating one to do, which is like – uh, I don't know. Uh, for instance, Katy Perry's music video where she's like, "Oh God, uh, yeah, no, she gets eaten or whatever." Yeah, with the spirit cooking, right? So oh, I don't gosh. know if I'm with a group of people and that comes on, I can be like, "Oh, Katy Perry's really into that spirit cooking." And again, it's like people will be like, "I don't know what you're talking about." I'm not, I'm not even going to respond. They either choose not to respond or they go, "Well, what's spirit cooking?" And I go, "Well." Thank you for asking. Let me <laughs> elucidate you to what spirit cooking is and how this sort of fits in and inevitably, you know, um, ends with, you know, the, the Illuminati is trying to rule the world. And then, you know, sometimes I'll lose them. But hopefully by then I've made, built a pretty good case. Um, so, you know, uh, I am in a privileged position that I get to – um, share about this stuff and talk about this stuff all the time in a uh, environment that doesn't that won't uh, ostracize me for talking about it. But yeah. in my real life, I like to drop little f hints that I know something that somebody else doesn't. I do it in a funny way, and I ask, then wait for them to ask about it. And if they ask about it, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, start <laughs> to to share. But if not, you Game know, on. I just don't bother. It you just can't. You know, if people aren't there, um, now I mean, you, your schooling situation's a little bit different when you have the opportunity to present a paper or something. But in you know normal life or with your family or something, I personally have not had a lot of success trying to convert people over to the canary cry way of thinking um in yeah. in in a in an explicit context where i'm trying to like evangelize canary cry uh, concepts canary cry views yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. um but it's very fun to try to l kind of lure people in and keep in mind that you can't blast their world so hard I mean, you're going, you're going to create tension, and so it's baby steps, man. Baby steps. Do you start with the Katy Perry video? End with the <laughs> Illuminati. Don't open with the Illuminati. <laughs> open with Katy Perry. Well, I took a few cues from. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with the Fuel Project. Uh, 
it's a YouTube channel. Uh, I think the guy's name is Mark Farrelly who does it. I'm not sure. I don't think I am actually. Uh, it's called the Fuel Project. He's got some really awesome. He does video kind of lectures, series, things like that. That was another one of the things I think that really kind of opened my eyes to the occult and conspiracy and Freemasonry yeah. and the Illuminati and all of that. Uh -huh. um, but uh, it's pro I mean, it's pro it's it's all old news to you, I guess, and anybody who's been around for a little while. But it's pretty good. But I took some cues from him in, in the teaching that I did. And you just start in Genesis with the deception of the serpent and you move on to Babel and then you move on to the whole just how this plan of, you know, the, the great thing about talking to churches about it, people who believe who hold to like a premillennial sort of understanding, a literal interpretation of the fulfillment of Revelation uh -huh. is it's like, yo, if a one world government is actually going to happen, like Revelation says, in a one world economy, and you can't buy or sell without this, like, how do you ever think that this is going to happen? Right. <laughs> and then you see, like, guess what? Start to look around. All of this stuff is... It's happening. All of this stuff is unfolding all around you. Right, yeah. It's kind of like we're just waiting for the for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. And as much as I uh, hate to say it, you know, if you get somebody on the line and they're interested enough to keep looking into it, you just send them that good old link to age of deceit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually haven't, uh, I started watching it, but I never, I never oh, finished don't, age of deceit. Don't flatter me. Don't you pretend. <laughs> Is really, that true? Have you not I watched it all the way check it out. I haven't. I started, and by the time I think I found it, I love you know Gans. He obviously does some great work, and yeah. I you know some of some of the shorter fifteen minute videos. I kind of you know have yeah. some time for, and I'll watch those or whatever. But yeah, I don't. What is it? Two three hours long? Oh, it's like I mean, three hours a long. Yeah, ton of work he put into that. But as I was, I was like, no, I already got caught up to speed through all the other stuff that you guys did. Like right. it's not like. It, well, wa it wasn't I, your eye-opening moment. Right, right, right. That wasn't the, the intro for me. But yeah, yeah. I got to no. ask, though. Yeah. Do you, do, you ever, do you ever engage with Facebook uh, dialogue and conversation, or do you, are no. you just wise enough to stay away from no, it altogether? No, I don't even touch it. I mean, I, no, uh, yeah, almost never. I can't even think of the last time I engaged in a, a full-on conversation. <laughs> I have reduced my social media usage to basically voyeurism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I just go on and then um and then you know from time to time I get myself in trouble. I made a post some time ago about uh I don't know deaths of children and yeah. versus abortion, deaths by guns and abortion and something and I didn't know how many how many friends I had that just came out of the woodwork mm. like this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Right. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never posting again. Yep, nope. You made a um, huge mistake, my man. <laughs> <laughs> but then I have to I mean I just have to I just have to bring it up because I'm not sure if you were if you were alluding to, but I made a comment on in the the actually in the Canary Cry community is the only oh. place I've said anything in the last I don't know, probably a couple, few months, maybe coming up on more than that. I haven't posted anything on social media, but sure. um, I was in there and uh, somebody had, somebody had posted something that was, that was, uh, it's basically just heresy. And Conversation I was like, that's, worthy. Uh, that's, can't let that one go. That's heresy. <laughs> I, I know what this is going to turn into. I'm probably not going to have the time to, to jump full in on this and and you know if you want to give me a phone call and maybe we can talk yeah while i'm driving or whatever that's that's one thing but um yeah it's such a it's such a difficult thing i think it was anthony patch again who was talking about this uh addiction kind of that we have mm -hmm. to social media right yeah because the was who was it one of the you you might know the guy's name one of the creators of facebook who ended up dropping off the thing um, basically said we figured right. out how to get people addicted to it. And then uh, he was talking about, I think Anthony Patch was talking about chasing the red dot or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. yeah. That whole thing. And then you look down at your phone and you just, I don't know if you're the same way, but I can't stand having the red dots on my phone. <laughs> like it doesn't matter if it's a missed call or a voicemail or something. I find myself looking at my screen and just chasing it around and, and clearing them all off or whatever. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I just – 
started to back away from social media because I started to question my motivation about anything I ever posted too. It was like, right. why am I posting this? Well, yeah, motivation is a huge part of it. And I had to, I think this is a great conversation to have actually when it comes to social media and especially when it comes to confrontational uh, interactions on social media, which is my motivation when it, when I'm tempted to do things like that is mainly because I think I know more than somebody else and I think that I know better and I want not only do I think that I know better, but I want other people to know that I know better as well. That is the that was the thing I had to completely root out of my life yep. was that it was like if I'm posting something that is coming back to people you know, praising me, yep. then, then there's something, then there's something definitely wrong here. Yep. Um, and that was, it didn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. You're on vacation and here's a beautiful picture. Look at the cool place I'm in. Yeah. Oh, everybody else thinks this is awesome. Look at the awesome thing I'm doing. And then you kind of start to look and, you know, I start looking at my, my social media and it's like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, that and then the the prophecy and not well not it's kind of a prophecy that Paul writes to Timothy in Second Timothy three you know note this in the last days there will be perilous times and then the very first thing that he says men will be lovers of themselves and mm. it's like if that doesn't describe <laughs> what's going on right now and you know what people have called the the selfie generation it's right like, my goodness yeah totally no i mean i have pretty much uh even on my phone i don't have facebook i in the past couple months got rid of instagram got rid of snapchat i still have twitter but that's mainly just for canary cry radio stuff um and I really only go on Facebook just to kind of, uh, well, you know, just for business, basically, just for the podcast stuff, you know. Um, I I do do a lot of voyeurism. I will just kind of scroll and just look at what people are uh, talking about. Um, but again, that's mainly if I'm trying to justify it to myself and God, uh, mainly just so I can keep an eye on where the conversation's at. Um, mm -hmm. cause it's important to, you know, I can't be totally disconnected and then expect myself to like be relevant on a podcast and not paying attention to what people are talking about. Um, so that's pretty much it. And let me tell you, you know what people, I heard people say this, I've heard people talking about it for years about how they got rid of social media and their life is so much better. I'm here to tell you and all the listeners I, not for one second have I thought about putting Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat back on my phone whatsoever. Not a single moment has gone by where I'm like, man, I really wish I had Facebook on my phone right now. Really wish I could do some scrolling. <laughs> like, never. It's not once happened. And and it's just the best. It's just the best way to live, people. I, you know, I really tr try not to tell people how to live their lives, but uh, I can tell from my personal experience that my life is, at the very least, not worse for getting rid of Facebook uh, yeah. on, on my phone. And at best, it has gotten significantly better. I, you know, you have, I feel like I own my attention again. Whereas with all wow. those, with all those things, you really are – your attention has been commodified and your attention belongs to the thing that you are giving it to. Face, if that thing is Facebook, you literally have conscripted your attention over to Facebook for them to monetize. And you know, I don't want to get too trippy about it, but I don't want to s give freely – one of my most precious things, which is my attention, I don't want to give that to Zuckerberg so he can buy another Hawaiian island and kick off the natives. <laughs> like, I just don't – I have no need to do that. Um, oh, man. So, so I recommend it for everybody. That's really – that's really good. Um, just the fact of giving giving away your attention. And that – I mean – 
it really it really does come it comes down to that because i you know i took an inventory one time of how much time i was spending you know in front of different social media platforms Mm -hmm. um and it was like this is this is so much time i think there's i don't know if you listen to any christian hip-hop but i think kb has it in one of his more recent songs where he said he spends he was spending more and i don't know if he was actually saying it as a confession or if it was just part of his song but spending more time on instagram yeah. than he did in the bible and i was like holy cow yeah. like how many of us is that the truth with and i've gone through almost seasons. everyone i would i would wager to say that that's probably the case um yeah. and i have fasted from social media before which is really funny because that's almost become a thing in the church <laughs> yeah, now as if that's like a huge burnt offering unto the lord it is though i mean <laughs> I know, it is I know. for people because <laughs> um and you know i'll i'll tell you that the same thing that you said you know in that time that i was away from it it was like oh my look at all this look at all this extra time i have look at all this attention that i have to put in other places but inevitably i ended up you know, taking them back, but you've, sure. um, I, I'm feeling pretty challenged right now. And I think well, I might just go ahead and yeah. after we hang up, just delete them <laughs> off my hey, phone. Hey, you have my full support and, you know, and it fits in one of the biggest things that people, <clears throat> that is a question that I've had uh, in many interviews and asked e- experts, um, But many people ask me, which is like, okay, the beast system. Okay. All right. You convinced me. Okay. Artificial intelligence. Okay. Everything. Revelation. Like, okay, what now? What, what do I do about it? And the biggest thing is you are freely giving one of your most precious, if not the most precious resource you have, which is your attention which is your gaze, you know, you, which, you know, depending on what translation you're reading could be your love. You are giving that literally you are injecting it into the life stream of the beast system um, when you can't pull your eyes away from anything in the beast system. But in this context, Facebook. Now, that being said. I still have to go on Facebook. Every, uh, you know, anybody who's friends with me on Facebook knows I don't post a lot as, you know, even on my Basil account there. I will check in on the groups and check in on the pages and I do that because it's where God has put the ministry for now. And so I do do that. I'm not saying I never touch the stuff, but really, why would you give so much of your attention into the very system that is here to destroy you, destroy your soul? So <laughs> anyway, well, and it's, it's one of the things, too, where it's like, I mean, you almost sound like you're having to uh, and, and I'm not saying you feel this way, but you almost have to to justify like going in to use it even, even a little bit, like you say it, you know, kind of like I have to go and yeah. look, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like nothing, basically, you know, what Paul says, is like, it's like all things are permissible. Uh-huh. Like yeah. you can, you mm. can do Very just good. about anything. Yep. So long as those things don't start to rule your, your affections and your attention. Mm-hmm. And then you get people who start to swing way far one way or the other, you right. know, growing up in a Baptist church, it's alcohol. You can't have alcohol. It's like, I'd love, I'd love for you to show me that in the Bible anywhere. Right. Definitely talks about, you know, becoming consumed with it and yeah. drunk and everything. And I guess people are just, people are drunk on the, on the wine of, of Facebook and the red yeah. dots right now. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the, with a glass of wine from time to time. And I don't think that there's anything wrong from totally with using Facebook, but totally. Yeah, it definitely. And as passionate and as loud as I've gotten on this podcast about it, I mean, yeah, I still visit Facebook probably uh, every other day, if not, you know, many days in a row. Um, and, you know, again, yeah, like you mentioned, just having to like justify it because of the podcasts or whatever. And, yeah, you know, I'm not going to condemn anybody for spending a lot of time on Facebook. A lot of people get a lot of value in one way or another. But just keep in mind, you know, your attention is very valuable. So be discerning about where you put uh, differing amounts of it. 
Absolutely. And what was it that you, I mean, you guys have said it a couple of times, but it's like, if you're, if something's being offered to you for free, then you are the product. You are the product, right? Yeah. You're so, (laughs) and with all that in mind, Make sure to visit facebook.com slash canary cry radio, like the page, uh, join the canary cry community. Lots of good people on there. So I got to ask you since you brought that up because it's come up in discussion there too. I have to, I got to get your opinion. On okay, it. sure. Where are you on the flat earth, man? You guys have danced around it a couple times. I got to yeah, hear, uh, will... hear you. We will continue to uh, do just that. Dance around it. You you can't make a you can't make a definitive truth claim about no. the shape of the earth. <laughs> I personally cannot make a definitive truth claim, but I will say, I mean, Gonz and I are both uh, un unconcerned about the shape of the earth, and <laughs> oh, I don't want to uh, belittle the. Um, the fervor and the passion that some people have for the shape of the earth, whether it be globe or flat, it is personally not of the utmost importance to my journey. Um, and, uh, but I totally get it. I totally understand it. In fact, actually, um, I bought, you know, I went out and bought some, um, like a laser thermometer and I did the moonlight test and was and <laughs> I you know I, I'm not going to say I was testing in perfect uh, clinical conditions in fact I've been wanting to set up uh, a little bit more of a scientifically rigorous experiment um, with the moonlight test but in my preliminary fun times having my new toy of a laser thermometer thermometer um yeah, the moonlight is colder than the moonshade. I'm just I'm just saying that's been my personal experience. Again, I could I could poke 7 bajillion holes in my experimental conditions. Um but on the one or two nights that I have brought out my thermometer just to play with it and do the moonlight test, I was a little shocked that uh indeed in again, in my in, imperfect situation, the moonlight was colder than the moonshade, and that's about as far as I took it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I'm I mean I'll go on the record I have before. I'm one of those you know, just good old traditional round earthers. Globe head man, um, you're called a globe, globe head. head. I uh, I don't remember who was reporting, but they went to one of the flat earth conventions uh-huh. and, uh, I think actually Rob Skiba was there. Uh-huh. Um, and they interviewed him and I had seen him, you know, a couple times before and I had, you know, seen some of his work. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I was like, he's pretty good. Oh, I, I like his stuff. And then I saw him there and I was like, Oh man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I had looked into it, but it's just one of those things where I ran into a friend of mine from high school, um, and we started, it just somehow came up. He said something about, he didn't have a phone and I was like, why don't you have a phone? He's like, I don't want the government knowing where I am all the time or whatever. And I was like, well, that's extreme. And then I was like, wait a second. And I start talking to him and we start going on and he's hitting on everything. Nephilim, yeah. Illuminati, the whole thing. And awesome. he's like, yeah. And, and the earth is flat. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I was like, whoa, I got a what? Yeah. Um, you know, and I started looking into it, you know, and I just couldn't. I was like, I don't. Yeah. I can go so far, but. Yeah. You know, uh, and here's the thing. I, I really am not even a strong globe head. I don't want to be taken out of context here. I'm really. <laughs> I I've looked into it i've done some experiments like i've mentioned i look at both sides obviously you know i'm conditioned as a globe head um but i i do find a lot of compelling um arguments for the flat earth i also find a lot of not very compelling and misinformation and misunderstanding of some pretty basic principles um that lead people to believe in a flat earth and I'm also, unfortunately, confusingly open to the idea that there are, you know, government plants or Illuminati plants in the Flat Earth Society, 
you know, giving bad information to discredit the thing, to discredit the theory. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I go back and forth on the whole thing. So I've decided I probably will never take a definitive stance <laughs> and thus make what if thus make travel. enemies of everyone. <laughs> What if Elon Musk gets his wish and uh-huh. they privatize space travel? I would and love we're that. Able to all go out and see it with our own with our own eyes. I mean, I'll, I'll believe what I see. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, as soon as I'm able, I am starting a Kickstarter to pay for my ticket on space tourism. <laughs> Like, that's not even a joke. There will be a Kickstarter to send Basil into space, and I will come back and I will report what I see. Uh, but unfortunately, again, not to get too heady, but even if you are in space, you can only see one side of the Earth at a time, and there's a lot of uh, really kind of trippy space f- physicist concepts that that's a very good use of words on my part space physicist um you know that would explain for an earth still being flat but appearing you know you just wouldn't be able to tell unless you unless you had four sets of eyeballs and you put all the eyeballs and all the axes <laughs> of the sphere at the same time i'm just not going to know until i get well, to heaven i you know, that's a very it's a very diplomatic answer, one that shouldn't ostracize any of your supporters. Oh, yeah. By any well, means. Thank you. Thank and, you. And but I also but I also understand, you know, I can say I, I I depart, you know, at a certain point, but I find myself in an academic theological community trying to tell people that angels came down from heaven and had sex with people and they, you know, are like, that's dumb. And then, you know, trying to explain the fact that Jesus might have been using geomancy in the sand. Right. And they're like, give me a break. And I'm like, it could have, it could have been. A right. Thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're, yeah. we, we are kin as far as that goes. Um, but I am always, I'm constantly surprised and I, I, it's not a joke. I literally do make enemies of everyone. Um, because, you know, we have a lot of flat earthers who are really actually like very upset that we're n- haven't like devoted our entire project to spreading flat earth, um, my, in- information. My, the main question that and I Glover. ask is like, I can see, you can look at something like nine 11 and you can see a clear motive. Like yeah. you can understand okay, this is why this would be perpetrated this way. You can look at, you know, the spying and all these different things that are going on and RFID chips and all this stuff, and you can see a motive behind it. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you can answer this question. Um, But I don't, like, what would be the... What would be the motive? Like, why even perpetrate such a huge lie that would involve so much information? To what end? Like, what is it? Well, uh, that's that's one of my biggest questions. And maybe you've had more discussion about it and you can answer it. But what what would people say is the motivation behind that? Those in kind of the Canary Cry camp um, would refer to it as an extension of the Great Deception. Um, whereas if, uh, you know, Satan can convince us of a globe earth, then we are talked out of, uh, you know, the, the dome concept that's present in the Bible. And if the dome concept present in the Bible can be discredited, then the whole Bible can be discredited. Um, Mm. so that, I mean, that's the simple roadmap. It gets a lot more complicated and I'm sure, I mean, I don't want to claim to represent well, the flat earth, the society, uh, flat earth society, flat earthers. Um, but from what I gather, that's my basic understanding is that if you can discredit a flat earth, then you discredit the Bible, I think is the basic concept, which again, I mean, I can totally see that as a valid uh, a valid motivation for somebody. I don't personally hold that motivation myself, but I understand it. Um, so yeah, and and I know I, I, I actually people call me diplomatic all the time, which I take <laughs> which I take as a compliment. 
Yeah, um, sure, of course. That's but, what I meant it. But it's 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 very auth- earnest. I'm very earnest about that. I I truly do. I'm not just saying that to keep my flat Earth lis- listeners like happy, because um, they aren't happy with me already. Um, but yeah, I you know I guess that's kind of the problem when you start taking big universal views at things and you're able to like empathize with other people's motivations is you find it very difficult to take a very super hard stance on the shape of the earth. Yeah. Um, but well, that kind of, yeah. I had another question for you that I was kind of wondering, like, I like how do this. You, how do you manage the, I don't know how many, you know, I don't know how many listens you guys get to or hits or whatever on your podcast or whatever. Uh-huh. It's, irrelevant i guess but i'm you know i'm sure it's in the whatever tens of thousands or maybe mm-hmm. more you know i don't know but it's how- pretty impressive <laughs> <laughs> i mean i know you know whatever I, sure. i've been over on face like the sun i think don says two hundred thousand subscribers or something it's like that's yep. nearly a quarter of a million people like, yeah that's a huge swath of people that are coming to you uh-huh. to hear what you have to say. Yeah. And I was just wondering if that does, uh, if that does anything like if it kind of like it tempts your ego at all, Mm -hmm. or if it causes you to, you know, be careful about the things that you say or how you say them. So as not to, you know, so that you keep the numbers up or whatever. And I don't mean that in a bad, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I'm just asking like, as a person who, You know, your supreme authority is the Lord in his opinion and his concern. How do you, because I, you know, I have preached before and I've preached in front of, you know, crowds of hundreds of people, you know, lots Mm -hmm. of, you're standing up on a stage and there's 700 people out in front of you that are all there listening to what you have to say. That's 700 people, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, wow. Like if you're not careful, it starts to become like, oh, people care about my opinion and what I have to say. So how do you. Right. How do you guys deal with that? Or does yeah. that ever come into your no, mind? No, that's a super good question. And actually, I'm, I'm. this is fun. I'm actually really enjoying your line of questioning. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, it is, it, it, it's been an ongoing process. And we've been podcasting for either a little over or a little under six years. Um, I think a little over. And it's, we've definitely, um, we, uh, okay, let me, let me try to, I'm, I've got a couple things I want to say. I'm trying to order them correctly. Gons and I both have had very intentional conversations, uh, with one another, uh, pretty much about the same, uh, 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 addressing that exact question, um, and we obviously came to the conclusion that we definitely don't want to be like that. We can't, I mean, oh my gosh, it's only by the grace of God that this became what it was, meaning Canary Absolutely. Cry Radio and Face Like the Sun and everything. I mean, that uh, we are, we feel so small um, in, yeah. com- in comparison to God's hand in all of Praise this. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. And, you know, whatever sort of, I don't know, uh, situations in our life that led us to be able to come to that conclusion. We are super grateful for, um, you know, and we made a commitment quite a long time ago to not pay too much attention to the numbers. Uh, we certainly, uh, look at the numbers cause they're just right in our faces and, you know, our hosting, company sends us an update every week. And so, I mean, the numbers are thrown at us, but we made a commitment a long time ago to not let that affect, um, how we approach our work. And one of the big things included in that is not advertising. Um, because the second, the second you start taking money for advertising, is the second you do start worrying about the numbers, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you get paid per thousand people who listen, um, and you can charge more money for advertising on your show. So definitely making a commitment to not 
advertising. Didn't um, you guys just turn down an advertisement offer? Yes, we did. Thank you for asking. Uh, we, yeah, we, I heard you mention. I think it was sometime right around there that I was like, I'm supporting these. Uh, well, I'm I, giving them money. I appreciate that. Yeah, this was actually – the offer happened about a month or two ago, and we got an offer from a very well-known Christian person in Hollywood to um, advertise a project of theirs on the show. And Wow, it that's was not even – the beast system advertising. It's just, <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, almost, yeah, that's for a whole nother episode, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, a Christian person and, um, and a Christian organization and a Christian project and totally kind of like up our alley and is something that we probably would like tell people to go see anyways. Um, but we made a commitment a long time ago to not take advertising. Um, and that was a hard decision to make. And it was kind of God saying like, okay, you can make a Patreon for Canary Cry Radio now. Um, because, uh, you know, I mean, it really does come down to that. We released that little bonus message, that little short message explaining the situation, letting people know we op- that, you know, we uh, uh, did a Patreon page. And I think people sniffed it out pretty quick. Because the numbers, <laughs> the amount of downloads on that uh, little message, I mean, nobody listened to it. Everybody saw like, oh, Basil and Gons have a special message. That's probably about asking for donations. We're not listening to that. Oh, I to listened that. to it. Well, yeah, okay, good. So at least <laughs> I did. there was a handful of people who listened to it and a handful of people who have since um, gone to the Patreon. And we're super thankful for that. Um but anyways, I forgot where I was going with this. Oh, so yeah. So numbers and ego and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm uh, again, and we're very grateful to God because he's the only, he's the only explanation for Gons and I not like getting huge heads about this whole situation. Um, because, you know, there's people who strive their whole life to get people to listen to them, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like a core human need to feel heard. And, yeah. and we're so blessed. I just, I mean, it blows our, my mind every time I think about it um, to have had this grow and for people to listen to us and f- for people to listen to us about stuff that nobody else will listen to us about. Um. <laughs> And so, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I have like a great tidy answer for that, but, um, no, I mean, that was, that was good. Yeah. And the thing is ultimately, I mean, it's like, no matter where you find yourself, I mean, I find myself, you know, in the situation that I'm at, you know, pursuing my education to the highest possible level. And it's like, you know, it was kind of, we, we opened talking about it. It was like, this wasn't my plan. This wasn't my doing. So I have to, you know, I'm continually reminding myself, like, I don't, this is only, only by the grace of God that any of this stuff is happening. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is very humbling, but that's, I mean, we look sometimes at, you know, whatever, it might be a podcast platform. It might be an education. It might be a job or whatever, but then, Ultimately, it just comes back down really to the to the central fact that it's like we're we're considered children of God. Like yeah. that is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, far and away uh, a, a greater thing to be humbled about. I go to the lady who pays for my education, you know, and she's up into the oh my gosh, if you know how expensive education is, I mean, it's the yeah. it's into the tens of thousands of dollars, you know. And I'm like, I I write her a thank you card every semester, and it just gets to the point where I'm like, I can't. I'm running out of ways to say thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like exactly. I don't I don't know what else to say. And then it just hits me like a ton of bricks. It's like, what is heaven mm. going to be like when I stand before God and I have him to thank for everything? Like how do yeah. you ever how do you ever express gratitude for those sorts of things? And that's the thing that, you know, always centers me and, you know, brings me back. But that was I mean, that's pretty much I mean, you really said the same thing, which I think is, I think is incredible. But I just wondered how, you know, that went. There was some little, you guys put some little tidbit at the end, I think, of the last canary cry or something um, about, uh, God, God said 
something about drinking the coffee or something. You were talking about a host episode or something. And I was like, oh, man, that's <laughs> like, I don't know what that was about. It sounded like kind of an inside joke with you guys or whatever. But I was like, I don't think I want to hear I want to hear what Basil has to say. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Like, man, you're you're I mean, some people take their podcast and their whole two hours. It's just them pontificating the whole time. And you're. Like I said, using your platform to invite others, you know, to have a voice in the conversation. And that really is such an incredible thing, I think, um, that you're doing. Oh. And that's why, you know, I started with being really grateful for that. I well, really am. Well, I appreciate that, man. And, and I really appreciate this line of questioning because it's really nice to to talk about. And I hope that people find it interesting and enjoy listening to it. Um, as do I, and I will just cause, uh, I, I do need to add this to the answers. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the, the thought of having a lot of people listen and, you know, having to think about, you know, the different demographics and different beliefs and cause there's a wide range of, uh, people and beliefs that listen to the show. And, um, you, often people comment on how diplomatically I will answer a question, especially if I go like on another podcast or something. Uh, it actually really frustrates other podcast hosts <laughs> the way I answer <laughs> questions because it's like it's just not fun to have somebody <laughs> give these kinds of answers. Sure. Um, but, you know, I really – it's not even that I try to approach conversations and topics with curiosity – is that I'm just generally obsessed with being curious about these things and deeply, deeply, profoundly uh, aware of how little I actually know and how much, uh, even when it comes down to like some basic things, that's kind of why I was so excited to talk you know, to you, a, a, a biblical scholar and uh, somebody who's in the field looking at these sorts of things because I've been hit by the awe and wonder of having my mind blown by something that I previously was afraid to even consider. Yeah. Um, and keeping that mindset is something that I would actually encourage everybody to approach and I hope – uh, you know, if they were going to take a cue from uh, the personality, you know, that I uh, have on the podcast and bring to my work is that uh, really all there is is to have deep curiosity about the things of God and let God lead it from there because that's the, the best way to do it. There you go. Absolutely. I had... And the thing that most people will tell you is even when you get to, you know, whatever, this level of scholarship or whatever, it's like nobody ever like there's a few things that you can make definitive truth claims about when it comes to the Lord. And there's a few things as evangelicals we have to make mm -hmm. definitive truth claims about. But then you get outside to all of that other stuff. And it is you you turn over one rock and then there's, you know, two more underneath of it. To, it's like. Oh my goodness, the the depth of it is yeah. It's infinite and you can trace all these things out and I think everybody has a story or a testimony where the same Bible story or passage you've heard a hundred times you come to it this one particular time and there's new life in it and there's yes. this new meaning to it and it just and it's it's got to be like that if God's going to keep our attention you talk about giving your attention to stuff if he's going to hold our attention for eternity <laughs> <laughs> then it's got to be like it has to go on for forever. Yes. And it has to continue to blow your mind. Ravi Zacharias has one of the favorite, one of my favorite quotes. He said, there always has to be a majesty and a mystery about God. Yes. Where there's this revealing that's blowing your mind, but then there's still something like just right, right around the corner yeah. that you can never fully trace out. And that's why, that's why I just encourage everybody. It's like, you don't have to go to, you don't have to go to school to study the Bible, study the Bible, man. Right. Just get in it. And that's just pray. And that's one of the, when I talk about, you know, staying uh, curious to what God has for you. I mean, there is always more. And the second that you lock in what you have or what you know or what you know what you uh hold dogmatically 
Um, you know, obviously there's good things to hold dogmatically, but, you know, being curious constantly about what God has for you is it never disappoints. It's the best way to go because if, you know, if you, if you're not curious, then you're just, you are choosing to not receive the next thing that God has for you and you're going to be locked in. And mystery is a great word uh, to describe all the things that God has for us. It's a continuous, continuous mystery. There's always more. And uh, it's just the biggest thrill to um, have him take you to the whatever's next. Um, it really is. But one thing I did want to say, and then we're going to uh, begin landing the plane. And then you, yeah. and, then you and I are going to talk after the show. Um, oh, great. Is uh, Okay, I did want to mention uh, on the topic of you know, um, uh, financial support and stuff like that. We, I, I just want to make sure to give credit and uh, not only to the people, but also to God as a testament to his, um, sustain sustenance, his sustaining presence in this project, because there have been and are very, uh, generous people who, um, are the only reason that the sh any of these shows are still going. Honestly, there there is a handful of people uh, who, if they did not answer God's call in the way that they did, uh, really, really, really good chance that all of these shows, and I'm talking Canary Cry Radio, Canary Cry News Talk, TJT, probably even face like the sun, although I can't speak for Gons, um, that it, it would just have been impossible for them to continue. Um, so yeah. I just want to thank God and thank those people. Cause I'm sure that some of them are listening um, that uh, just to remind them that they're answering the call is, um, is really the only reason this stuff still exists. Can uh, I just can I just jump in on that? And yeah, I don't mean to. Yeah, please. I don't mean to. Uh, uh, whatever hijack this. No, no, please, or please do because it's. I, I <laughs> see it similar to the woman who's paying for your education. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it it definitely is, and I want to. I mean, I want like, anytime I'm I'm invited to speak in at another church or in another pastor's pulpit, if you can even say that it's God's pulpit. Yeah, but yeah. if someone gives me a platform in their church, I always take the time when I'm preaching in someone else's church to speak well of the pastor to the parishioners in the church. And, you know, in a sense, I've already, you know, I've already, you know, given you some compliments and I, I, I think you're wonderful. I think what you guys are doing are great, but now I would like to honestly just say to all the people who are listening, like if you're tuning in every single week to either, you know, news talk, or I'd love to say every week to Canary Cry Radio, but it doesn't quite happen <laughs> every week. <laughs> it could though. It could. <laughs> right. Or if you're tuning into this or whatever, like, you know, I support for ten dollars a month. I might, well, I might, I might up that. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I actually think <laughs> I'm going to start supporting the Joy Spiracy theory. I'm making a public d declaration right now. Oh, I'm going throwing to. your hat over the fence, brother! I, I'm throwing it in right now. <laughs> but I just seriously, if you're coming to this week after week and you're being encouraged, educated, or even just entertained, see how I alliterated that. that was, I am a preacher. That was very good. <laughs> then you need to, you need to support $10 a month. Most people spend more than that on a coffee or on stupid frivolous things. It's like, seriously, just get behind it and give them some support because I, I would love for more, you know, I would love to be able to hear you guys. There's other people, you know, I had mentioned the Hackmans. There's three hours a day, every day, man. Yeah, it's like, those guys cow. are hardcore, man. <laughs> They're going after yeah. it. But like, I think you guys, I think it's really where it's at. And that's why I was like, I'm going to start giving them money. I think I might start giving you more money. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but everybody out there listening, <laughs> seriously, come on, get behind these guys. Uh, this, All right, that's it. This I'm is, done. this is fun. I like the, the turn that this took. Um, uh, <laughs> Patreon.com slash the Joy Spiracy Theory. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I, I thank you very much. I continue to 
uh, just love this conversation, but uh, we're going to have a revolt on our hands if we don't land this plane. Um, yeah, let's land. Okay, couple questions. Number one, what's something that you just love? What in your life is there something that you just love? Oh, man. And, and I... Jesus is a given, your family is a given, and pets are a given. Something. Yeah. S- some... We didn't even get to talk about pets. Oh, well, man. well, we're not there yet. You just hold on to your britches. <laughs> um, and it can be, it can be so sound... simple. It could be like Play-Doh or something. Yeah, it's going to sound like almost terrible and corny, but I don't really care. Um, I really love uh, sunsets. Oh, gosh. I sound like, oh, <laughs> oh it's terrible. Oh. Oh. I hate saying it. I know. No, no, it's good. But I love this. I seriously, there have been so many times, even just tonight, um, the the room that I'm staying in um, is, you know, it's got the window out facing the west with the steeple of the chapel, uh, wow. you know, right behind it. And there was just this beautiful wash of just orange and purple sky today. And it's like every day, and especially being in Florida, and I'm, I know you guys get them out there in California. <laughs> yes. Um, it's just like every day God just paints this picture in front of you. And it's like, here you go. Yeah. You have a terrible day. Oh, look at this. You know, look at this that I made. And I just, I, I don't know. No. It was just today. I just saw a great one. And those are just, that's just something that I really can't get enough of. Yes. I love that. I love that so much. And I agree. I'm, I, and it's not, it's not every day that I really appreciate it, but it, a sunset's one of those things. It happens every single day, and you don't think about it until you see it. You yeah. know, it's like you don't think about it. And again, yeah, it's kind of cheesy, kind of corny. I, I, I'm not gonna like try to defend that, bro. <laughs> but it totally <laughs> no, is. It is. But I, I too have those moments. I that's a great answer. I would probably not. I probably would never have given that answer just because I don't even think about sunsets until I see them. And whenever I see them, I even if it's like not that great, just the you you kind of I don't know I'm kind of addicted to feeling small. I like that feeling. Um, oh, yeah. It might just be a weird like theological thing of mine, but uh, but I I feel small and I love it. Did you get to see the solar eclipse? Oh yeah, bro. Oh my gosh. Oh me yeah. Too. I took a trip with talk about feeling small. That thing that like It was weird. It was crazy. Dwarfed me. Oh my goodness. I uh I took a trip up to Oregon. And oh, yeah. so now everybody knows I'm south of Oregon. Um I yeah, <laughs> took a trip up to Oregon right in the path, drove nine hours, literally arrived in the place to watch the eclipse uh, like 23 minutes before it happened. Yeah. Parked the car, got out of the car, set up chairs, sat for 20 minutes, saw it, was blown away, had my mind blown by the whole thing, got in the car and drove back home. Was it just you? Did you stay with uh, the buddy? No, no, no. I, I was with a couple people. But uh, oh, we did okay. not stay. We did not spend the night. We just drove up there, watched it. Yeah, worth it. Yeah, worth and drove it, right? back. Totally worth it. It was oh, my amazing. Gosh. I knew people that were – we were in Florida, and it was you know probably a five-hour drive. We ended up watching it, I think, somewhere in South Carolina right when it was getting ready to leave. Yeah. And it was six, maybe seven hours or something at the most. Yeah. And people were like, you're going to drive that far? And I was like, it's a solar eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand seven hours i would drive 24 hours to see yeah. this are you guys crazy and then it, of course it didn't it didn't disappoint but talk about feeling small yeah that was oh that might be something that i love i guess and we'll have another chance for one. Oh, here's another everybody who's out there if you missed the last one if you are in the continental united states it is worth the drive from wherever you are what is it 2024 and then it makes that X, right? Some of those Bible prophecy people, it's going to be the end of the world. So oh, wow. probably be your last chance. Yeah, right? nice pull. <laughs> I, did not know th- I did not know there was another one hitting oh, the you continental didn't? U- U.S. 2024, huh? Seven years almost. Wow, that's like, crazy. Isn't it weird? Almost oh, seven years. And then this one went from spooky. the northwest down to the southeast. The next one starts in the southwest and goes up to the northeast. Oh, wow. And then it crosses like right over 
some Salem city. There's a Salem in every state, but some weird, it makes some weird intersection where, you know, all these Bible prophecy people with their whiteboards and stuff are calling for, you know, another end of the world yeah. on that. But I mean, it is a little bit. I'm sure as we come closer to the date, there will definitely be a Canary Cry radio episode that comes out about that. I'm just calling that shot right now. Um, so we'll remind you that it's coming up. And so will the rest of the world. Um, okay. All right. Awesome. Good. I love those things. We both love those things. Everybody listening now has just been reminded how much they love solar eclipses and sunsets and go watch them go watch them go do it uh okay what do you got in the way of furry friends bro what do i have in the way of come again furry friends those oh, pets those friends. cats those dogs those giraffes maybe they uh, got scales you're a student do you yeah, have time here's the i don't uh, and i have i have my whole life and this is going to be i i almost don't even want to say it i've been a cat person oh yeah um, yeah i know it's kind of weird cat people are <laughs> a strange breed i guess but i've always preferred cats um i've had several cats in my life and they have either been my younger viking brother um has run over two of them in the oh no yeah, t- yeah. We we would let a lot of them in and well, one of them we would let in and out. It was our the oldest cat we ever had. She's like thirteen years old. I think she was slow. Yeah. And he got in and started his car. She didn't know and he backed over and killed her. It was oh terrible. my gosh, how awful for your brother too. He hated it yeah. because he had to watch her die. I was uh, somewhere else. It was bad. Oh god, then, that's heartbreaking. I had a cat that ran out of the house as he was leaving and darted under his car and then he was backing out. That is a nightmare. That Two cats he ran over. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Wow. So they've either died. I had one cat that I loved so much, but he ran away forever. And then I had a living situation change where my favorite cat, I named him Jones after Jones in the Alien movies because he was a little orange stripy cat. Nice. He was probably the best cat ever. Um, I had to, I had to um, find him another home when I moved, actually when I came up um, yeah. for seminary. But here's a little here's a little fun fun fact that I learned when I was a cat owner. One of my cats, um, you know how they're always rubbing their heads up against stuff. Yes. Do you know why they do that? Because they own us. <laughs> well, they have glands. Oh yes, right. Right behind their noses, up on the up on their gums, like their top gums. Yep. And this is the deal: they hate to be touched there. But if you develop a certain level of trust with your cat, you can actually massage that area on your cat. And I used to have my one of my cats, and I started doing it. At first, they kind of hate it. They're like, Get, stop touching me on my mouth and in my face. You know, and they kind of pull back. Right. But then they start to realize, whoa, this feels really good, like whatever he's doing. And then <laughs> yep. they'll just chill there. So yep. my cat – used to come up and he would like if i'd be sitting there watching tv or on my bed or whatever he'd come up and he'd just get right up in my face and he'd just lay there and i'd start petting him and it was almost like he would just kind of like no that's not what i'm here for i'm here (laughs) for the thing and he would i'd start rubbing his gums and he would he turned into putty and he'd start drooling like he would literally drool on me it was awesome Mm -hmm. so all you cat owners out there if you've never given your cat a good gum massage yeah i got a drooler too good old good old monty um, yeah, you know, I think, I, I think I, me and one of the Montes developed that, uh, weird face massage <laughs> habit too. I did not know that that was necessarily the fact. So that's very it's interesting. It's a thing. Yeah. Okay. Get up on those gums, everybody. Oh man, this is a weird podcast. Um, <laughs> um, Okay. So no pets now. No probably. pets. Okay. I don't know. Lord will. The, you're leaving it up to the Lord. Yeah. If he, if one comes to my door, I'll take it as a sign. There you go. You're either predestined to have a cat or there's That's free it. will. Who knows? <laughs> the theologians are still out on that one. <laughs> That's it. Um. Okay. And uh, you're a student and you're 35 or so. How you doing with that? Uh, keeping it, keeping it nice and nice and healthy, man. You've been eating your kale. What's the deal? You juicing yet? Have I brainwashed you into start juicing yet? 
Um, I am, I used to be on a really, on a really stringent, um, diet. I used to be like, I was lean and I was a machine, um, and I was running every day and like just, uh, I mean, it was, I was, I was doing really good. And then kind of around school time, um, I kind of just fell off the wagon Mm -hmm. Um, and it hasn't been good. You end up sitting at a desk all day long and you end up reading all day and you become slow. So I've kind of been off of it. You start morphing and start morphing into that, uh, that, (laughs) that, uh, theologian's body. (laughs) You start looking like old paintings. I just saw a picture of David Platt today. That guy has been like in CrossFit and stuff. He looks like a, you know, I it don't. It's like some kind of model. I wish I had what it takes to like hit up whatever, whether it's CrossFit or really just any sort of intense thing, as often as some people do. That I don't understand where they get the time, don't know where they get the energy. I wake up in the morning and I think to myself, "Oh man, it's been a rough one already, huh?" <laughs> and I just can't bring myself to I need to and I have been there I've been that guy I don't know who I was at that time I feel like I don't even know myself anymore but um yeah. but yeah anyways all right buddy you and I we we'll get there someday I got to get back on the I got to get back on the bus but one thing that I did this was another another little testimony in this I was up every morning at like five o'clock hitting the CrossFit. This is back when I was in great shape. Whoa. And uh, like, it, like every day I would run five miles a day. I was biking. I was like, I mean, it was nuts. And then I'm in seminary and I'm hearing about all these pastors and all these guys who used to wake up at four o'clock every morning and spend four hours in prayer. <laughs> right. And yeah. I was like, how do they do that? Man, that's crazy. <laughs> and then one day I was waking up and putting my shoes on and hating my life and walking to the gym. And the Lord was like, you can get up for the things that are important to you, can't you? And yeah. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. That's totally true. And okay, so here's something that has helped me in the past and it's going to help me in the very near future. You know, I was thinking to myself, man, if only there was a button that I could push that I knew for a fact would give me whatever, the 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 body that I want, you know, the that would make me lean and mean and give me all of those muscles. If only there was a button I could push uh, that would do that. And then it occurred to me, probably the Holy Spirit being like, there is a button. It's just hard to push. And if you push it every day, you just push the button, then you'll get what you want. The only reason you don't have what you want is because you don't push that button every day. I'm like, yeah, that's totally true. I mean, diet and exercise, I mean, is what you do. That is the button. You just got to push the button and do it. Sometimes we're you too, just got to do it. Sometimes we're too tired to push the button, though, and that's that's our own fault. That's okay. We'll get there. You know what I'm? What I? Uh, a funny thing I tell myself is that, uh, you know, I'm just trying to gain a little weight right now so that I can lose it and be an inspiration to others and uh i've told i've told myself i'm packing it on for when the lights go out you know when the emp hits i'll last a little bit longer than everybody else when the food supply stops totally the electricity that's mine the electricity in my neighborhood went out yesterday and you know, it's like, oh, this is it. This is what we've been training for. This is what, <laughs> <laughs> like, full on apocalypse. Have you done any? You might not want to disclose it. Prepping? Do you have any any extra? Yeah, I've I things do, around. Yep, I I've, I I've I've been open about this. I've done mild prepping. I am mildly prepared. Yeah. Um, that is to say, more than ninety nine percent of people. Um, but definitely not like full prepper status. No, yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of the same. And that was one of those things too, where it's like you know I'm like buying stuff, and my family's looking at me like, "What's wrong with you?" And I was <laughs> like, "Trust me." Yeah. But my whole deal was I quit because I was like, when when it happens, guess what? My family's going to need food, and yeah. my neighbors are going to need food, and all these people 
what am I going to hoard it all to myself and just, I'm going to give it all out and it's going to last for like three days. So <laughs> right. it's really not, we're going to have to come up with something else. Yeah. 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 No, I, uh, I went through a phase and I just kind of was like, well, I mean, I pretty much got everything I would need. And, you know, prepping's like one of those things where it's kind of like, I mean, a lot of people have made it into a lifestyle where yeah. like, that is your lifestyle is like constantly prepping and I just couldn't make it into a lifestyle. I just did it and now I'm prepped and I'm prepped and that's it. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Deal with it when it happens. Um, but that being said, I do recommend everybody do some level of prepping yeah. uh, and figure out something. I mean, at least mildly and, prepared. Yeah. And that's not a revolutionary statement. I mean, the like, government tells you to be mildly prepared for oh, yeah. natural disasters even stuff like that so well we just had a nasty hurricane that irma you know that came through down in florida oh yeah was, yeah 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 i was sitting there like i'm already ready for this junk man <laughs> everybody else is running out and i was like yeah i got stuff i'll be fine for a yeah couple weeks. it's good to stay on your toes every once in a while replenish the storehouse okay yeah. christopher land it I, down. I realize I never said your name this entire episode. You did. That's the first time I said I your didn't. name. Yep. There it is. Yep. So there you go. That is your name, Christopher. People will know that from the title, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, thank you so much, man. This has truly been uh, just so enjoyable. I mean, one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had in life. So you can't mean that possibly. I possibly an exaggeration. I possibly can, and I am prone to hyperbole. But that was, I truly, truly uh, enjoyed this very, very much, and I'm super, well, super glad that you responded to the short notice. It's kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of what it takes to get on the show. But uh, you were, you were, you were great. So thank you very yeah. much. And well, ask, I appreciate it. And asking me all those questions that was very fun. Yeah. Well, I I knew what to expect, so I knew it was going to be great because I've heard you, yeah. you know, well, plenty of times. So I was like, this is going to be awesome. But you were just <laughs> you were just coming in blind. Well, you know what's funny is uh, you don't know this now because it's not out yet. But um, uh, the 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 most recent episode uh, when this comes out, now we're doing some podcast time travel here. Uh, I answered a lot of questions. And so, I don't know, this might be a fun thing to kind of open it up for people to ask me questions uh, just as sort of part of the format. Not that people don't ask me questions if they do, because they always do. But I don't know. Maybe I'll just state that for preparation in the future. Um, Inquiring minds want to know. There you go. There you go. I can just give unsatisfyingly diplomatic answers to all sorts of things. Um, okay. All right. We're landing this. We're doing it right now. Thank you so much. Put a much. sound effect in right now on the plane. <laughs> yeah, I'll just – you know what I'm going to do? We're not even going to say bye. Post production. Yes. I'm just going to – music has been fading up for a few seconds now, and it's just okay. going to fade up until – Well, there you go, folks. Hope you enjoyed that conversation. I certainly enjoyed my time talking to Christopher. You know, very smart guy. I love the conversations about the Bible and, and, and reading it correctly or reading it in ways that maybe we haven't done so before. Um, just one of the parts of the beautiful tapestry of Christ Christendom that we get to participate in. I know talking about uh, biblical academia can be a little stressful for people, challenging some assumptions can be can be uh, 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 challenging, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's only in the spirit of bringing all of us closer together under our head priest, Jesus Christ. That's right. Okay. All right, guys. Well, that's about it for this episode. I just want to remind everybody an episode of Ask Bass getting ready to drop over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash uh, the Joyspiracy Theory. 
check that out. Get a shout out on the show for your furry friends and get access to all the bonus content. Already three episodes of Ask Baz available there as well as um, a, a other bonus content. It's a real fun time over there. And if you have questions for the next episode of Ask Baz, please send them to basil.rosewater at gmail.com or you can head over to the joyspiracytheory.com and there's a little uh, tab on the right hand side. Leave me a voicemail message. You can ask to come on this show. You can ask me a question for Ask Baz. It's just a great way to get in touch with me and I love listening to those and sometimes they play at the end of the show. You know, sometimes that happens. Um, okay, I think that's it. There's a the uh, uh, Facebook popping off. We got stuff go- going on over there. Facebook.com slash the Joyspiracy Theory or search the Joyspiracy Theory. Great way to keep up with what we're doing as well as wonderful Bible and cat memes and all sorts of fun stuff. You're missing out. If you're not liking that group over there, make sure to go do that. Uh, what else we got? Oh, head over to iTunes right now. I know you're out there. People haven't been leaving reviews lately. Uh, go to iTunes or whatever you're on. One star is bad. Five stars is good. And a review is telling people it's good or it's bad. You know, you got to let them know. And the robots will thank you. I will thank you. But until then, everybody, keep on being good. Go get them. You got this, tiger. Hello. When I cook my dinner tonight, I am going to put basil in my pasta sauce. And I am going to eat it all until it's gone. So, <laughs> good day.